Home check. I'm an armed private security officer in Colorado Springs, and over the past few months, my company's been doing a specific property check within a community we already patrol at night. 1315 Wood Ave has been an interesting thing in the past, better known as the Burns Mansion, on Old Millionaire's Row in the Old North End. James Ferguson Burns, who died in Colorado Springs, was a very wealthy man across his numerous endeavors in the greater Colorado area. His death was suspected in the mansion on September 23, 1917, as well as a few servants on the property. Earlier this year, 2020, acting as an eight-unit apartment building, a suspicious death occurred on property, promoting the city to step in. After conducting the police and forensic investigation of the death, the city immediately shut down the entire property, and it was renovated, and was also brought up to code. But these events displaced all the tenants and families with no warning. It was said that James Burns dabbled in spiritualism via spirit board or mediums. On the night of September 21st, the patrol officer was on duty for that area. Our normal SOP for the property is to check around the enormous house and to ensure that the primary structure is secured and that area homeless haven't made entry. After dismounting from my cruiser, I began to check the street side of the property, starting at the front cellar access, which had no added normal signs. A discarded coffee cup from one of the contractors, a few piles of wood, stuff like that. So I started toward the grand patio that nearby wraps the front facing side. At the far end, I noticed the porch swing was slightly swinging side to side, not back and forth. But I thought nothing of it, as this home is at an old location. I began around the rear of the mansion, and as soon as I came around the gate, I heard a staggered elder's man's voice faintly coming from the servants' quarters on the second floor of the carriage house. So instead of checking the rear of the mansion first, I followed SOP and went straight to investigate the sounds. At the mouth of the carriage house was all the discarded personal items of the tenants that were displaced, and they were unable to collect. Making a path to the stairs was an uneasy trek. Old furniture, toys, photos, and such covered most of the ground. While trying not to fall while making my way, I heard the elderly voice again, but it was still faint and unintelligible. Now know that the possibility of an intruder was nearly 100%. I drew my sidearm and clasped my light between my fingers. I announced myself in the loudest command tone I could manage, leaving no doubt that I would be heard. After the second attempt of commanding that anyone identify themselves failed, I moved up the stairs. The second level is in such a state of decay that it looked as if the setting of a horror movie. After clearing the small four-room area, I had only a small walk-in closet left, thinking surely this is where the subject is. I kept my sidearm level and I whipped the door open. Nothing. Nothing occupied the space. I holstered, thinking that I just had too much or too little caffeine, or a raccoon was being playful. I exited the carriage house to resume checking the mansion door barricades to ensure that they were either locked or undamaged. While at the parlor doorway, I saw a shadow from behind the door under the straight split at the bottom. Aggravated, I ran to the parlor window, flashing the entire room to see who the hell was walking around inside. Again, nothing. No sign that anything had been inside since earlier that day. Now pissed that so many weird things were happening, I checked the rest of the doors, which were all locked. I headed back to the cruiser and lit a cigarette. As I took a long, exasperated drag, the inside lights flickered off briefly. I look up to the second floor, where a discolored face peered out before the light sprang back on. I flicked my butt and said to myself, Yes, yeah, screw that jumped into the car and called out. 1315, code 4. Clearing. Mac Nope. Two years ago with my current armed security company, we had a shopping center at the suburb of Rick Rim in Colorado Springs. In the shopping center was an old closed down McDonald's. Local legend is that this McDonald's was haunted. Dead former employees, an Indian burial ground, cursed, 
The story varied from high school to high school, and growing up a few miles away, everyone knew the legend. My company started providing services to the whole shopping center due to teens hanging out after hours, homeless camping in the front of the shops and in the self-service car wash. But this McDonald's was abandoned, closed for a long time. Sometimes we would have to respond to calls from the property manager about would-be ghost hunters and Wiccans trying to get in to do God knows what. Well, one warm night in August, while training a new hiree, we were walking around looking for kids and homeless, when from the car wash we hear an ear-shattering sound from inside the McDonald's. We ran straight over flashlights and guns drawn, scanning every corner of the exterior structure. We had no key to access the inside, but were permitted to enter if someone had forced their way in. But there were no signs of entry, no damage. The fire ladder to the roof was still up. So confused, we looked at each other, wondering how a scream could have come from inside. The new guy was fresh out of the army and was new to the area, so we had never heard the stories. I began telling every version I knew while he kept shining his light through the window to see if anything was inside. While on the last iteration involving the Indian burial ground, the new guy yelled out the least manly scream I've ever heard. Without the words finding their way out, he just pointed to the window. I looked in from where he was standing. Standing in the opposite side of the store from the window stood a shadowy mass, about six feet tall with large white eyes. It stood there examining us for a brief moment, then darted into the back kitchen area. I grabbed the new guy by his shirt and started running to the back door opposite side of the building, thinking some prankster would run out. But no, the door was still padlocked from the outside. We called the property manager and CSPD out to search the building. When the property manager arrived and opened the door for the cops to clear the building and property, the manager came over to ask, Saw it, did you? The three of the CSPD officers came out within a few minutes saying that nothing was inside. We got a call screen number for a report and went on to the next patrol property. For the rest of the night, the new guy was very quiet, saying very little, and after his first night solo on patrol, he ended up quitting the next day, no resignation, said very little, and handed over his uniform and equipment. To this day, I don't know why he quit, and he wouldn't speak to annoy on the staff after departing, so I wonder if that figure with the large white eyes still haunted him. Piano Poltergeist When I was 19 working in unarmed security, I was placed as a flex officer at a retirement home while the regular officer went on vacation. The first two shifts were learning the main care hospice building and learning the apartment and the cottage buildings for the independent seniors. Usually we only had to check the outer buildings a couple times at night to make sure no one was wandering around and no wildlife were getting in the trash. But my experiences began in the main building on the second shift, after the regular officer had left for his vacation. One of the morbid duties that wasn't an overly often occurrence was escorting a body from the facility with the coroner to usually the family of the resident. On that night, a very elderly woman passed around 1 a.m. with her daughter and grandsons around her. Just after 1.45 a.m., I greeted the coroner at the service entrance and we took the elevator to the third floor. The ride was unsettling. Both myself and the coroner were in absolute silence in the elevator ride, and it seemed to feel like hours long. My eyes were fixated on the gurney, donning a reddish body bag with the funeral home logo. I stood at the room door as the family cried as the nurse and coroner took possession of the woman's now lifeless form. All of us, including the family, walked into the elevator to go to the ground floor level, to see her into the medical van. And as it pulled away, the grandsons thanked and shook my hand for my assistance, though I felt I had done nothing. For the rest of the night, it seemed slow yet eerie. I kept thinking about the gurney with the body bag and how life is uncertain. The following night, I was sitting at the welcome desk, sitting across from our on-duty nurse who dozed off. I was reading a book about the history of the occult when I noticed from across the main reception hall, where entertainers or youth groups came to lighten their spirits of the residents, the desert carousel machine with its dim soft white light flickered. 
It didn't flicker due to an electric default, but instead as if someone was standing in front of it or walked past it. I walked out to see if a resident was maybe looking for a late night treat, but the area was void of anyone but myself. I brushed off the oddity as just my eyes started acting up. As soon as I returned to the desk, the grand piano that sat halfway between the desert carousel and my desk struck three keys. I began to get spooked, so I decided now was the best time to do a property check. As I was returning down to the last resident hall toward the reception area, I heard the music of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. I felt my blood go cold. I staggered toward the reception area hoping to see a resident or even the nurse. As soon as I hit the threshold into the reception area, it fell dead silent. I nervously checked to see if there were maybe a player's piano, but found that it required a pianist. As I was still inspecting the piano with my light, the nurse walked over. Why did you stop and play? It was really nice. I turned with confusion and a little bit of fear. That wasn't me. The nurse's face went white. Stone, do you know what time it is? She extended her wrist to where I saw the time, 1.07 a.m. We both went out to the smoking area, which was probably not permitted for resident safety reasons. Shortly after the nurse refused to be left alone, so I accompanied her. When she did her rounds checking on all the residents, while on the third floor, two doors down from the recently deceased woman's room, we heard faint music. The family was still in the process of removing her items, but one item was left on her nightstand, and we found that it was the source of the soft, haunting song. Sitting there was a small music box, playing a haunting version of Moonlight Sonata. middle-of-the-road motel. As some of you may know, I'm an armed uniformed security officer in my city. Well, two years ago, my company was providing services for a motel named the Knights Inn. The motel was preparing to shut down for a massive remodel, as well as code and structural updates. Now, the motel was previously two separate motels, but when the Knights Inn bought it, they merged properties into one. During nearly 20 years of running between both of the original motels, they saw some rather negative events. This location just happens to be within walking distance from the county jail, so when a number of people were released from custody, they found their way to this motel over the years. Murders, drug overdoses, and suicides were all reported on the property. All these dark events left negative imprints on these grounds. Fast forward to when I worked on the property during the overnight hours and three events during three separate shifts where I worked, and the one I responded to as a cover officer. The first was on my fourth shift. The first few went very slow and boring. No one had told my staff the history of the property at this point. Well, the second to last three-week operation, I was helping on night audit, preparing the morning breakfast bar, and the kitchen was not part of the building that had long since shut down. The auditor was preparing waffle batter and filling pitchers of orange juice when an unopened 12-pack of canned soda exploded next to the service access stairwell that was padlocked from the inside of the service hallway to the kitchen. The auditor's scream was chilling, as well as deafening. Well, due to some of the less than upstanding guests they'd rent rooms to, I began downstairs to find that the doors were still secured and no one could have entered through. I then stuck my finger in the puddle of soda thinking that it may have overheated or something, causing them to burst, but nope. It was slightly cool. As I looked at the auditor still shaking, holding a small kitchen knife, trying to calm her down, we both heard a loud little girl giggle, but it sounded unusual. We, needless to say, both bolted from the kitchen back to the main desk. Five minutes later, the auditor told me, no one checked in tonight has kids. The following week, in the last week of the location being open before the remodel, I was doing the standard grounds patrolling, making sure no doors were unsecure or people fighting. Just about the time I finished, I got a call from the front desk calling a Code 6 priority. I ran back to the office nearly tripping on the stairs in the courtyard. Once arrived, I saw a young black woman with her daughter, just the cutest little three-year-old. 
The mother was crying uncontrollably, but managed to tell her husband was not himself. After nearly an hour in their room, he pulled a knife out of nowhere and started wildly swinging in the room at his wife and kid. The wife said that he hates weapons and wouldn't have had one, so I began searching the grounds for the man and found him sitting in a dark corner of the courtyard area. He had the knife in his hand and was blankly staring ahead. Once the knife hit the light, I saw blood. Then I noticed he was bleeding. I ordered he drop the knife as he slowly started to walk towards me. I repeated it a second time, then a third, and I order I drew my weapon and ordered that he stop to think about his kid. Right as I did, three local officers sprang from behind me. Two of their CEW tasers drawn. In a quickly happening display, I heard the deputy order, then followed taser, taser, taser. The local officers took the man in custody, and he was having me fill out a statement when I overheard two of the deputies saying, Want to know what's odd? The room they were staying in had a suspicious death a few days ago, but detectives say it was drug-induced suicide. The other deputy replied, Huh, what are the odds that this guy went nuts? I think personally that that's a little odd that a man commits suicide. Come to find that he cut his arm till he bled out, and then a week later another man loses his mind, cuts himself up, and is unresponsive the whole time he was being spoken to. The most damning paranormal event, in my opinion, that happened was the first week closed for remodeling. I was walking around in the inside and another officer stopped in to hang out and break. I made the suggestion that we sit in the old restaurant and see if the place was for real haunted. He reluctantly agreed. Using a spirit box app on my phone, that before that night, I thought I overpaid for, we sat and asked questions. For about 20 minutes, nothing came through, and we joked that maybe the place wasn't haunted at all. I thought I saw something across the room, so I tried maybe to light it, but come to find my flashlight had died. So while sitting at the table, I pulled my taser out of the holster as we sat in a pitch black room to use the light if needed. Instantly, the spirit box app said, Yellow gun, in the same voice. Now, mind you that me and this other officer had the same level of training, and we were fully certified to the city, but his response was, Fuck, does that mean by yellow gun? I then proceeded to place my taser on the table and turned its light on. I never heard so many F-bombs as he stormed out of the room. The final incident I am still kind of unsure of, but the one phrase the subject yelled, There will be more ghosts here tonight if you enter. Four weeks after the motel closed, I was working a city patrol. When the on-duty officer called for priority backup from all available officers on duty, Sam 262 nights in, what's the situation? The officer responded, four to six persons who made it enter into the back building barricaded themselves into a room. I was the first responding officer just after 3 a.m. and met with an officer on duty. As we were talking to a third officer, we heard three gunshots ring out from down the hallway. At this time, we contacted the local sheriff's office about the situation, and within minutes several deputies arrived in ASV, active shooter vests, and helmets. We attempted to reach the room as we watched from the end of the hallway. Five more shots rang from the doorway, and luckily no one was struck. The deputies fell back to the end of the hallway, where the three of us were. A supervisor for the deputies' order watched the hallway as the rest took position around the building. We asked what we needed to do, and he replied to block the entrances to the property. And no one comes on that it isn't an officer. So basically, we were to keep out of the impeding reporters. SWAT arrived, and the deputies pulled back, and the SWAT took position. The whole time the suspect saw the activity from the windows and holes of the door, a lieutenant with SWAT and a public relations officer came over to me and the other guy on my staff, asking us what happened before deputies responded. We all heard from a broken out window. There will be more ghosts here tonight if you enter. Around 5 a.m., the SWAT armored vehicle pulled up next to the back of the building and we hear three thumps. SWAT shot OC shells into the room before breaching the windows and doorway. And just as soon as we hear the thumps and see the smoke, 
Five of the suspects were being carried out, and a sixth was being rushed to the straight board into an ambulance. Come to find the man with the pistol in the room, took his five friends hostage and attempted to kill himself when SWAT breached. He later died at the hospital, so I wonder if he joined the other ghosts in the motel. After that night, we no longer provided security at the Night's Inn. Eight months later, it reopened at some new aged hipster hotel. I haven't been to that property for some time now. Even though I pass whenever I work over the city patrol, I wonder how the property is and if the paranormal activity still happens after the remodel. The Caretaker My dad grew up in New Orleans in the Ninth Ward. When he was a kid, my biological grandfather died in the line of duty with NOPD. Jumped when I was eight years old while my father was visiting my grandmother for the summer and my dad wanted to visit my grandfather's grave. As some of you may know, the graves in New Orleans are above ground due to the terrain and moist swampy soil and can be labyrinths of family plots and crypts that can be foreboding. We went to visit on a Thursday afternoon in early June. Though it was super hot and humid, my cousins were saying it was cold because of the cloud cover. I'm from Colorado, so cold is nothing to me. But I don't do heat well. When at my family's plot in the center of the graveyard, I wandered off because I needed to use the bathroom and foolishly listened to my cousin who was the same age where the bathroom was. After 30 minutes of wandering around not knowing where the hell the gate or reception hall were, I decided to pee on an old willow tree. After whipping my head back and forth several times to make sure I wouldn't get in any trouble for doing so, I finished up. When I was done, I realized I had no clue where I was. The tombs, plots, and crypts look completely different, being old, dirty, cracking, and weathered. I tried my best to retrace my steps, but no luck. I began to panic a little bit. Here I was, eight years old, in a cemetery I'd never been in, or have never really remembered being to, and waiting for the crazy New Orleans summer rain storms to let loose. I started to cry a little and kept walking. And after a few minutes, I found an older man that was working on the plot. Brownish overalls, cream light yellow t-shirt, and an old time brimmed hat. He was a big, strong looking dark black man, not trying to sound bad, but as big as Michael Clark Duncan, and as dark as Wesley Snipes. He said his name was Frank and he was a working caretaker for the grounds. Frank was very kind and nice to me. Frank told me, take my hand son and we'll get you back to your folks. We begin to walk past several rows of plots and tombstones and shortly got near to where my family was. At three rows out, Frank said, All right, buddy, just head down these next three rows and turn left. Your family will be down that way. I shook his hand and he gave me a big warm smile. I got to the third row and turned around to wave goodbye, but Frank was gone. I went down to my family where my dad was angry. I went off alone and my mom was freaking out, but I knew I was in trouble, so I cut my mouth shut. When we finally left before 6 p.m., we stopped at the gatehouse before it sign out or something. I looked confused, looked at his screen, and then a notebook. He started to say, Boy, you and your family are the only folks since 2 p.m. that were here besides me. I said no, that Frank was on the grounds, and he was the keeper. He replied, Hey kid, there is no groundskeeper named Frank that worked here. You must have imagined it. I screeched at him. No, he helped me when I got lost. We left shortly after. But to this day, I know I was helped by Frank. I don't know if he was a real person or a kindly spirit, but his warm, kind smile made me feel safe, like everything was all right, being lost in a New Orleans cemetery. Night shift at the deaf and blind school. I've been working armed security for nearly a decade now, but I still remember working unarmed when I started out in my early 20s. I worked my way to a trusted position with my agency, where at 20 years old, I was assigned to the Colorado Springs deaf and blind school. At the time, my only senior, more experienced officers were permitted to work there at all, but I was given the 9 a.m. to 5 a.m. shifts, Monday nights through Saturday mornings. Little backstory on the deaf and blind school. It was opened in the early 1870s. 
and was where the burdened children of the state were sent to learn and live. But many were put to work there as laborers working fields or manufacturing items. Because of the number of ailments, accidents, or pre-existing health conditions, a large number of children and staff passed while there, to where in the early 1880s a small cemetery was created, formerly at the intersection of Pikes Peak Ave and Institute Street. Growing up in Colorado Springs, I was always told ghost stories about the flesh-eating bacteria and stuffed taxidermy animals, ghosts walking in buildings and the haunted service tunnels below the school connecting to the old train depot but never really believed it. Fast forward to my third month posted there, two nights before my 21st birthday, and a full week before students returned to the fall semester for actual special needs schooling, and I had my first encounter in the gym. While checking the boys' locker room, a solid black figure ran past the showers. I rushed to find the intruder, not knowing what I would have done to it if I really found it, as I was completely unarmed except for a flashlight. After clearing the building twice and checking all the doors multiple times, I just took it as my imagination. The night of my birthday is when everything got much weirder. The shift change went as normal. And everything was fine up until 2.30 a.m. Property and buildings check. When I went into the carriage house's top floor, where the school stores all spare desks and modern school equipment, it appeared that a person was standing in the back corner near the older stairs. I shouted at the figure and began to charge towards him. In a frenzy, I hurried to cut him off at the first door. But when I got to the door, it was still locked, and it was interior bolted. I searched the first floor when I found the doors to the service tunnels opened. On my first day, I was told never to enter the tunnels alone, as they expanded for miles in a labyrinth. And before I went in, I didn't contact a supervisor. I felt as if I walked for hours, but after only a few minutes... I hear in a very soft voice, almost like a kid's voice. Happy birthday, Mr. Officer. The next thing I knew, my very angry supervisor, the school's maintenance director, and two CSPD officers were shaking me by the shoulders. My supervisor then informed me I missed my 3 a.m. check and was sitting in the corner of the tunnels in the dark for three hours. We all left the tunnels in the carriage house to see that the sun was beginning to rise. Later that day, my boss reassigned me to a different location after I was cleared from a doctor to go to work. I don't fully know what I saw when I was in those buildings, but it still gives me the chills. I never forget the voice that made me black out for so long. Happy birthday, Mr. Officer. My Haunted Apartment as a child growing up in South Africa, I always had a fear of the dark. However, this fear was amplified when my mother and I moved into our apartment from my grandma's house. It was strange because at my grandma's house, I had no fear of sleeping alone. But in this new apartment, I couldn't even bear the thought of being alone in the house. Every time I left the bedroom, I would close the door because I always had an eerie feeling that something was watching me. My mom would dismiss my fears, but I knew deep down that she was just trying to make me feel better. We moved to a new apartment complex, but that's when all hell broke loose. I started seeing shadows in the corner of my eye, and I would keep the main door open when I came home from school, so I could open the curtains and turn the TV on and make it less quiet. I kept a Bible by my side at all times, and whenever there was a blackout, I refused to stay inside, and I'd wait for my mother to come back outside. The complex had connected hallways, so it would become pitch black when there was a blackout. Even the bathroom scared me, and I would always ask my mom to close the door after using it. One day I overheard my mom talking on the phone, and she mentioned that the previous owner said that the place was not spiritually clean. One day during a blackout, I was getting ready for school when the washing machine started shaking violently. I finished getting ready and booked it to school, refusing to go back inside until my mother came home later that day. I lived in that apartment for three or four years before moving back to my grandma's, but the paranormal experiences didn't stop there. To this day, I still have more stories to tell. I've always believed in the spirit world, but never experienced it myself until my daughter, as a child, I'd always been fascinated by the spirit world. 
I would eagerly watch shows, read books, and enjoy videos about ghosts and other paranormal phenomena. It was clear to me, even then, that children and animals have a special sensitivity to these things, and I was always intrigued by their experiences. As an adult, I found myself in a unique situation. My partner's house was haunted by not one, not two, but three spirits. His mother had told me countless stories about the strange occurrences in the house, and although I spent a lot of time there, I'd never experienced anything truly unsettling, just the occasional feeling of being watched or seeing something out of the corner of my eye. But there was one presence in particular that I had always felt, a male energy that seemed to linger in the basement. My partner's uncle had passed away three years ago, and I often saw shadows moving around in that area of the house. One day, while playing with our two-year-old daughter in the living room, something strange happened. She suddenly looked forward towards the door and began to cry. She, I guess, was scared. My partner and I stopped what we were doing and asked her what was wrong, and she said she saw a ghost. At first, we were skeptical. After all, she was just a toddler who probably picked up the idea of ghosts from Halloween cartoons. But then my partner picked her up and faced her towards the door, and she immediately started screaming and grabbing onto him tightly. I quickly took our daughter into my arms and tried to comfort her, assuring her that the ghost wouldn't hurt her and everything was totally fine. Then I asked her to tell the ghost to leave, and to my surprise, she did. As soon as she said the words, she seemed to calm down and relax. I have to admit, I was more scared than she was. I had always been fascinated by ghosts, but I would never experienced anything like this firsthand. It was a strange and surreal experience, but it only deepened my interest in the spirit world. I couldn't help but wonder what other stories were out there, waiting to be discovered. The Ghost and Demon from the Garden As I sat perched on the kitchen counter, gazing outside and lost in my own thoughts, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. Turning to face the source of the disturbance, I saw a dark, ominous shape looming in the distance. It seemed to be watching me with a malevolent glint in its eyes. It grinned, stretching unnaturally wide across its shadowy face. At the time, I assumed that it was merely a person who had come to visit, perhaps a friend of my parents or a neighbor dropping by for a chat. However, as I approached the door to investigate, I quickly realized that there was no one there. Confused and a little unnerved, I ventured outside to see if anyone was hiding nearby, but the street was deserted. Returning inside, I asked my older brother if they had seen anyone lurking around the house, but they informed me that they had left and my father an hour earlier, both of them. I was perplexed, but ultimately shrugged it off as nothing more than a strange and inexplicable occurrence. However, as I grew older and began to learn more about the paranormal, I began to wonder if what I had seen that day was something far more sinister than a mere figment of my imagination. The idea that a demon may have been lurking outside, its fiery red eyes fixated upon me, filled me with a deep sense of dread and unease. Over the years, I thought back to the days, countless times, wondering what it was that I truly saw, what I may never know for certain, whether it was a demon or simply a trick of the light. The memory has stayed with me, constant reminder that there are things beyond our understanding that may be watching us from the shadows. Throughout my life, I haven't had too many paranormal experiences. However, my recent encounter with the other side has left me with an unforgettable memory. It started when my step-grandma passed away. It was a sad and difficult time for her family. But what happened that night made me believe that there was life after death. The night she passed, my significant other was sleep-talking. He said something about Elizabeth, which was my step-grandma's name, and it caught my attention immediately. He had never heard her name before, so I knew it was something strange. Curiosity got the best of me, and I continued to have a conversation with him while he was sleep-talking. He mentioned that there was an old lady in the house, and my heart skipped a beat. But he continued to say that she was at the foot of the bed. At that moment, I was surprised that I wasn't scared. I felt like my step-grandma was stopping by to say goodbye. It was a bittersweet moment, but I felt grateful that she had thought of us in the transition to the other side. 
This experience made me believe that there's more to this world than what we can see with our eyes. It's opened up a new perspective on life and death, and I feel blessed to have had this encounter. Even though it was brief, it was a reminder that our loved ones never truly leave us. They may be gone physically, but their spirit lives on. It's comforting to know that they are watching over us and still present in our lives in their own special way. Stop making noises. I must say that the paranormal has been a constant presence in my life, from my earliest memories as a child to my present state as a 23-year-old adult. The range of my experience is wide and varied, but being suddenly yanked around, to being pushed down onto my back, to even being scratched by unseen forces, it seems that everywhere I go except for one place I encounter paranormal activity. At first, these experiences would leave me feeling spooked and unnerved, but over time I've grown accustomed to them. It's strange to say, but I've become desensitized to these occurrences. I suppose it's just like any other experience. The more you encounter something, the less it affects you. Currently I'm living with my grandmother, who's in the early stages of dementia, and I'm taking care of her. One night I was laying in bed, scrolling through my phone, when I heard a loud gasp or grunt at the end of my bed. There was nothing at the foot of my bed except some bins, and the sound was definitely human-like. Without any hesitation, I looked toward the end of the bed, took a deep breath, and said, Shut up, bitch. It's not like that I'm trying to be rude, but honestly, I was too busy to be with any ghostly shenanigans. Be honest, it's just another day in my paranormal-filled life, but I can't help but wonder why I seem to attract these otherworldly entities. Is it something about me? Or am I just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Regardless, it's become part of who I am, and I'll keep on living my life, ghost encounters and all. A shadow figure I saw when I was a kid. As an adolescent, I've never had any paranormal experiences to speak of, except for one that stayed with me to this day. It happened on my birthday when my mom's old boyfriend, Scott, took us to the cabin on a campsite, along with some of his friends. On one particular night, everyone wanted to check out an abandoned cabin on the campsite, so I had to go along even though I would rather have stayed in the cabin. But when we got there, I found that it was dusty and filled with old belongings that were left behind. I decided to stay on the first floor, but while I was there, I saw a shadow in the closet that made my skin crawl. It wasn't like any other shadow I'd seen before, and it didn't seem to have a source. I knew it couldn't have been one of Scott's friends, as the shadow was far inside the closet to have been cast from the outside. The shadow was completely still and didn't move at all. It was definitely not mine, as it was too small to have cast such a large and ominous shadow. I wasn't scared at the time, but I couldn't stop wondering what it was and why it was there. To this day, I have no explanation for what I saw in that closet. I do know that that cabin used to belong to an old couple, but whether that had anything to do with the shadow or not, I can't say. The experience has stayed with me all these years, and it made me even more open to the idea that there might be more to this world than what we can see and comprehend. Lived in a haunted house with scary energy. Current home is my family home, moved out and back in, where I need assistance in how to move forward. Whether it's cleansing, tapping in, basically just remaining in charge of my home and understanding how to handle it. When I was in my late teens and early 20s, I lived with my ex-boyfriend Shane and my daughter Leela. I believe whatever energy or spirit was in the home may have been attracted to my ex and possibly latched onto my daughter and me. Backstory. House is an old, maybe 20 years when I moved in. We were the third people to live in it, and I actually knew both previous occupants, who had no issues with the house. Shane is Haitian from Haiti, and came here young and was a Canadian citizen. Although Haiti is known for voodoo-related things, he wasn't a believer and could make excuses for everything. So to list things that happened, daughter between one and three during this time period, 
My daughter spoke very early and was one and a half talking about black hole in her house. She pointed to it every time and was fixated on it, but terrified of it. One time her toy rolled under her table and I told her to get it at around age three, and she hesitated and cried because the black hole was there. I was putting on my daughter's jacket to go out, and she asked if the lady upstairs was coming. Daughter scared to sleep at night because something was in her closet. I'd have Leela sleeping with my ex. He'd be out. I'd wait for him to come home because I was scared to sleep in the house most nights and I'd hear heavy footsteps up the stairs and down my hallway, stopping at my bedroom door. Bedroom door also flew open aggressively, smacking a wall, and the door was shut and the handle broken so you had to open it a certain way. I was already looking in the direction of the door, and I was terrified. The house door opened for Flo while I was cooking during spring. Shane and Leela outside. Out of the corner of my eye, I see someone enter into the kitchen behind me, my back turned doing the dishes. I feel Shane brush up against me and start talking. As I turn around, I realize no one's there. This was the only time I physically felt whatever it was touch me. When we first moved in the first few nights, we slept in the living room. Shane wakes up in a panic claiming to have seen an old woman's face appear. We had people over and everyone was downstairs. I was upstairs in the child's room and noticed Shane in the yard. So I opened the window and yelled out to him. We exchanged a few words. Then he said, who's behind you? I said, no one. He gets frustrated and says, I see them. Who are you with? He was jealous always. I say, I'm alone. He went into the house, saw everyone at the table. As I'm just coming down the stairs, I have no idea what had been behind me. I had just finished my shift at work. I have my daughter in my arms as I talk with my few coworkers. A regular customer comes in and joins our conversation but she stares at my daughter and instantly blurts out, your daughter sees someone, doesn't she? A woman. Then she said, this isn't family. This is someone she's afraid of. I got caught off guard, but this validated that I wasn't crazy. Shane told me he woke up and saw something dark leaning over me as I slept. Within seconds, he was frozen with fear. He shut his eyes and started praying. He opened his eyes again and it was gone. I woke up in a panic, gasping for air. No memory of the dream or sleep paralysis. Which I also had at times with a tall man with a hat over me. Shane told me what happened and refused to sleep. Often woke up gasping, feeling like he hadn't slept at all. Had to rearrange my furniture so my back wasn't toward an open space. But I still felt angry eyes always on me. Very scary feeling. My family house I'm now in is what I need to help more navigating. When I was young, there was a bedroom that faces the stairs, and I refused to sleep in, because I always felt watched and uneasy. Now as an adult in that room, not every night, but sometimes I feel exactly when a presence enters my room. I often ignore it, but it's creepy. Sometimes I feel like my bed shakes, or like my cat is jumping up and walking, but nothing is there. I do feel watched the odd time, example, on the treadmill, and feel someone behind me, so I get off and leave. I don't share my experience with my daughter, now 14, in the house in order to not freak her out. She's told me many times she feels like she's being watched, and she has seen something in our kitchen she thinks, all the lights off except for the TV, where she was, and I don't feel any threat in this house, but the unknown is unsettling at times. I've wanted over the years to connect with a psychic or a medium to give me insight, but I haven't. Would be open to it. Any tips on safely communicating with three ways to cleanse space and keep me and my daughter in a safe space? Any practices to add to my routine? Dying relative sees my unborn child I didn't know I was pregnant with. Let me regale you with a fascinating and mysterious tale of my grandfather's final days. He was in his early 60s and suffering from heart failure, a condition that's landed him in the hospital for a protracted stay. As his family, we spent a great deal of time with him during the last two weeks, trying to provide comfort and companionship during his time of need. One day, a group of six female relatives, including myself, were gathered in his room. 
chatting idly with him as he lay on his bed. Suddenly he interrupted her conversation in an abrupt, startling manner, looking around the room with a sense of urgency. "'Which one of you is pregnant?' he demanded, his voice quivering with emotion. We all denied it, confused by his outburst. "'Someone in this room is pregnant,' he insisted. "'Who is it?' None of us had any idea what he was talking about. At the time, we had been experiencing a great deal of pain and discomfort, and we assumed that his medication was causing him to hallucinate. We had been saying strange things like how people were visiting him at night and how there were a lot of people in his room at times. He had even claimed to see people who had passed on. We chalked it up to be delusions of a dying man and thought little more of it. But then a few weeks later, I received some devastating news. I had become pregnant, but my ultrasound revealed that my baby had a weak heartbeat and that I could expect a miscarry. Sadly, within the week, I did suffer a miscarriage. The timing was eerie as my grandfather's outburst had occurred just two weeks into my pregnancy. It was as if somehow he knew that I was pregnant, despite my denial and disbelief. This incident's always made me question what people see when they're near death. Was my grandfather truly seeing visions of the future, or was it just a coincidence? The mystery only deepened when my grandfather was intubated. The medical staff had to take everything out one day, and he managed to find the strength to communicate with my mother, expressing his fear of dying based on what he had seen. Unfortunately, he passed away the next day, leaving us with many unanswered questions about what he had experienced in his final days. As I reflect on this strange and inexplicable event, I can't help but wonder what the secrets are beyond the veil of death. Is there a hidden realm that only the dying can see? Or is this just a trick of the mind? It's a mystery that may never be fully solved, but one that will continue to intrigue and fascinate me for years to come. Research. I'm wondering if anyone knows where or if I could find old records from my childhood home. Are there any online sites where I could access the records for it? I can't go to the town hall or courthouse for a while, as I'm in the UK until May. I'm writing a book about the hauntings that went on in this house, and I'm trying to find some old history about it for some filler pages in the beginning of the book. There was a guy who my sister knew who did some research on the property and told us that there was an old farmhouse that got destroyed by a tornado sometime in the 1900s, and that a grandmother, mother, and little girl died. Apparently, the father and husband rebuilt the house on the same property. He died, and then someone else added to the house in 1988. I just wanted to do some digging to see how much of that is true, because not only will it help with the book, but it'll also give me some insight into the hauntings that went on in that house especially the violent entities that were in the house. So the things I'm trying to look for are property information before 1988. Were there any deaths in the current house as well as the old farmhouse that was supposedly on the property? If available, names of the family who perished in the tornado. I want to see if they have any living family members. I know it's a long shot, but I'm going to full research mode with this. My first experience up close. To start, I've been helping my mom move places for about two weeks now, and one thing I'm currently still working on is flooring. She decided to reuse her previous hardwood flooring in this house, so it's up to me to use as much in this transfer without wasting a single wooden plank. All that was left to do today was a single room, hall on the top of the stairs. It's just a two-floor house, so the second floor can also be considered as the attic. I realized I forgot some tools at my own place, so I went back down preparing to leave when I noticed something upstairs. But it was too brief to make out what it was. I thought I had seen the light flickering. I did switch off the lights to save energy, so I thought maybe I didn't operate the switch properly. Turns out that wasn't it because when I came back, I noticed I only switched off the light in the hallway downstairs, but not upstairs. Both switches are next to each other. So I was still thinking and I imagined things. When I went back up to do some other chores, clean up and move most things downstairs so it's easier to lay the wooden floor. 
I just got downstairs when I noticed the light out again at the corner of my eye. It does flicker, not with the same pace or interval like a strobe light, but like it was struggling to stay on, like how a fluorescent tube flashes for a moment when you turn it on. So I just stare in disbelief, because it was working fine for the last two weeks. In my mind, it couldn't be broken at the verge of dying, but it was indeed flashing. Just when I wanted to take a closer look by turning around and attempting to climb the stairs, it stopped. When I got back upstairs and went back to work, it happened again a couple times. The light was flickering from the top just briefly for maybe a minute, minute and a half, sometimes less, then it would stop for a while. Only when I said something about it out loud, or asked or demanded it to stop, it stopped. And it didn't happen again. I was there for maybe five hours in total today, and the crazy thing is, is that another light is connected to the same switch and wiring. But that was totally fine. As if the flashing happened because I was working, while normally it would be quiet, or I wasn't allowed to be there. A man named Cyril Jones on Thanksgiving Day in 1954 had a strange encounter with a middle-aged human-looking being that had psychic abilities that Cyril was sure was not human. This is a great encounter story if you haven't heard this one. I came across this encounter story recently and I find it very interesting for a number of reasons, but mainly how much it resonates with the more modern hypothesis of paranormal phenomena today. This story comes from a book called The Alien Gene by Myra McGee, released in 2020. It's a book all about the encounter stories with beings, but this was probably my favorite. Here's the story. Cyril Jones was working at a gas service station on Thanksgiving Day in 1954 in the Pacific Northwest U.S. Himself and two other guys were on a job. The weather was apparently exceptionally bad. At around 10 a.m., Cyril described a middle-aged looking man that was approximately 5 foot 8 in height, was of average medium build, had gray eyes and salt and pepper hair. Cyril described this man as unkept and stubbly facial hair and really old and beaten up clothes and shoes. Cyril came to the conclusion that this man had been traveling for some time based on how rough he looked. The man said the transmission on his car had broken and that he just wanted permission to roll his car into the service station so that he could fix it himself. This man claimed that time was of the essence as he was driving to save a friend from cancer. He had already come all this way from Alaska. Interesting note is that Alaska did not become a full U.S. state until 1959. The other two workers that were not Cyril overheard this man's story before heading to the service garage where they started snickering jokes to each other, calling bullshit that he actually had the technical skill to fix the transmission. This man started directly relaying to Cyril the exact jokes and conversations the other two workers were cracking at the moment, even though they were now on the service garage where they could not hear them talking. At first, Cyril thought this guy must be an expert lip reader, but starts questioning that internally due to how precise he was being and the fact that he couldn't even see the other workers. They were now out of sight. Cyril thinking to himself, can he really read people's thoughts? Is this guy for real or is this just some sort of trick? The man just looked up at Cyril right in the eyes and said, Young man, I am very real. Cyril, a little shocked but intrigued, helps the man push his car into the service garage and describes in awe a wide variety of instruments that covered the man's dashboard. Cars in 1954 didn't have much on the dashboard, and unfamiliar items in the trunk. I wish this was more elaborate, but alas. Cyril said, Once they got in the garage, the man quickly got down to work and did so with clear precision and expertise. Cyril came to the realization that this man was highly educated and intelligent. He thought how, outside the mind-reading trick and the odd appearance, this guy was like any average man. He still couldn't shake something was off, however. While the man was working, he talked to Cyril in a quiet and articulate manner. Cyril thought to himself that this guy was likely in his early to mid-fifties, but the man replied back that he was much older than that. Having outlived several wives and having children, grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren, this is when things got really interesting. The man went on to recall his life living in various places around the globe before telling Cyril about the ruins of mysterious lost cities in the Himalayas and Andes mountain ranges where beings from entire other worlds land their spacecraft. 
and other places on earth which had special energies for which those knew how to tap into them. The man went on to explain how in addition to extraterrestrials, there are also beings that exist far beyond our ability of perception in another dimension that are always and have been on earth. It isn't clear if the man started talking about the ETs or the interdimensional beings now, but says a group of these beings appeared in humanity's hour of need, but we had to believe and sincerely seek them out, implying that we didn't. The man goes on to say that primitive and early people and cultures made contact all the time, but as humans became more civilized and less spiritual, have, have lost this ability to time. Cyril asks the man what he knows about the pyramids of Egypt, and he replied to him that the Great Pyramid of Giza was not a tomb, like mainstream history says, but that it was built by an ancient race of people that had been banished from Earth. That's ominous as fuck. The Egyptians, as we know, merely inherited the Great Pyramid from this lost race and civilization that the pyramid's purpose is to be a mathematical statement about the Earth and the Earth's relationship to the Sun, Solar System, and greater universe. The man goes on to explain this aura or invisible force field that's part of every living thing and that this is where what we call psychic or telepathic abilities come from. That all living things have the potential to tap into these gifts, but our modern society and culture teaches us from a very young age not to trust or grow such abilities, writing them off as coincidence, imagination, or kids just being kids. The man was explaining all these things all while working on his car. While Cyril didn't entirely understand everything the man was saying, and some of the technical language used, he was fascinated by the conversation. Cyril also mentioned that while asking these particular questions out loud, the man would begin answering his questions before he even finished asking them, as if he was anticipating or already knew what he was going to ask next. Cyril says that the man repaired this transmission faster than he'd seen anyone fix one before. It took about an hour. The man started his car, and it roared to life. Before he left, he put on his old, faded trench coat shook Cyril's hand and said to him, There's not enough time to tell you more today. Look into these matters on your own. Keep an open mind. You'll be a better person for it. The man hopped in his car and drove away. Cyril thinks it's still odd that this man just drove off when the weather outside was still horrid and not safe. He also realizes that he never asked for the man's name. He later came to the conclusion that the man was some sort of non-human intelligence. Welcome to Paranormal M, the channel that explores the most mysterious and unexplained phenomena. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on our latest spine-tingling tales. Hope you're ready for an unforgettable journey. The Cursed Mansion Across the Road This experience happened a while back, but I thought I might as well share it on here for you guys to read. So in the mid-2000s, I lived in this house with my dad, my mom, and my sister. Across the road from this house was this massive mansion, which had a lot of residential turnover, which my family included, believes is cursed. My sister and I were kind of scared of it. It was always a big, dark house that felt uninviting and cold. When my family moved in, it was a wealthy businessman living in the mansion across the road, who moved in a few months before us. This guy was really rich. Luxury cars massive dinner parties with his rich friends. He owned a bunch of businesses and started a new business shortly after we moved in. And after almost six months of starting this business, he went bankrupt. He lost everything. He sold all of his luxury cars and he had no more dinner parties and he was quickly an alcoholic. He ended up selling his house because of course he couldn't afford it. After he sold the house, a young recently married couple moved in. I have no idea how they afforded the house, but nonetheless, they moved in and settled in quickly. My parents actually became quite good friends with them, and we'd have them over for dinner occasionally. They stayed in the house for about two years, but within that two-year period, they had three miscarriages. The wife ended up becoming depressed and even had to be committed to a psych ward because she was thinking about ending her own life. These two incidents could be clarified as maybe bad luck or unfortunate events, but the third one, in my opinion, solidifies this house as being cursed. 
So another couple moved into the house. After the other couple decided to move on, and this couple were, they were also pretty wealthy. They hired a maid to stay in the house and assist them with cooking and cleaning. After a year of them living there, we once again got pretty close to this couple, and we'd sometimes have dinner with them and swim in the pool that they had. One night my dad woke up and had a strange feeling. He heard something outside, so he looked out of his bedroom window and saw a maid packing her car in the middle of the night. The couple that was living there was for maybe away for the weekend or something like that, and the maid was staying at the house. He thought it was weird and was a bit concerned, but didn't think much of it and went back to sleep. After he went back to sleep, he had a dream that the maid ended up ending her own life in the garage of the house. He woke up in the morning a bit shaken from his dream and had a sort of sixth sense feeling. He decided to go over there and check if everything was okay. He rung the doorbell but didn't get an answer. He decided to go around the back of the house and see if the back door was unlocked. The back door was unlocked, so he went in. He entered the living room and saw a maid hanging from the chandelier. He instantly ran home and called the police and ambulance, but by that point, it was far too late. I remember seeing my dad after the event, and he was white as a ghost. Of course, he didn't tell us what had happened, as we were very young at the time. He ended up telling us when we were about 15 or 16. I don't bring it up to him because he hates talking about it and gets very upset the whole thing. We moved a little while after that event happened. I still have no idea what happened to the next family that moved in, but I seriously hope that nothing bad happened to them. I know this story is kind of hard to believe, but whenever I tell people about it, sometimes they don't believe me, but I can wholeheartedly swear that this happened, and to this day I'm convinced that the mansion was cursed. My Paranormal Encounter with The Installers My first post here For as long as I can remember, I've been plagued by paranormal occurrences, from apparitions in the night to strange noises and inexplicable events. I've experienced it all, and these encounters have left me with a sense of unease, and I often wonder if I'm particularly vulnerable to such phenomena. One of the reasons why I believe I'm so susceptible to these experiences is due to the near-death experience that I've had. One such experience occurred during my childhood when I passed away in the hospital. It was a harrowing ordeal that left an indelible mark on me. Since then, I've been convinced that I have a connection to the supernatural realm. Despite my lifelong fascination with the paranormal, I've kept my experiences to myself, and it wasn't until recently that I decided to come forward and share my story. The incident that prompted me to do so happened last year in my new home. It was a typical day, and I was in my bedroom when I saw two, perhaps three, foggy humanoids opening my closet door. Although the figures were semi-transparent, the closet door moved and opened. I watched in fascination as they mounted a strange device on the closet shelf near the top of the wall. Once they had finished, they turned to look at me, and one of them even smiled. Then, as sudden as they had appeared, they turned into wispy apparitions and disappeared through the exterior wall. The experience left me shaken, but it wasn't the first time I had encountered these installers. I had a similar experience in my previous home, which I may share at a later time. Although I couldn't see a physical device mounted on the shelf, I knew that something was there. I tried to place an item on the shelf to test my theory, but it was as if an invisible force prevented me from doing so. I remain on edge waiting to see if something similar happens in my new home since I recently moved yet again. Perhaps they are following me, or maybe I'm drawn to places where the veil between this world and the next is thin. Whatever the reason, I'm certain that my encounters with the paranormal are not yet over. Life After Death As human beings, we're naturally inclined to ponder about the mysteries of the universe, and one of the most profound enigmas that continues to bewilder us is the nature of life after death. Recently, while pursuing the vast subreddit of unexplained phenomena, I stumbled upon a video that captured an eerie sighting of a malevolent spiritual entity. 
This ominous footage has reignited my curiosity and contemplation of the subject matter at hand. It's evident that each one of us have been drawn to this forum because of our personal experiences with the unexplained or inexplicable occurrences that have taken place in our lives. Therefore, I pose the question to my fellow members. Do you believe in the existence of an afterlife? Is there a spiritual realm beyond our physical reality that we cannot fathom or understand? For me, the answer is a resounding yes. The intense surge of activity and inexplicable happenings that I've witnessed in my own home has left me with an unshakable conviction that entities and the spiritual realm are indeed a reality. Objects being hurled at me without any plausible explanation and a long random scratch that appeared out of nowhere on my forearm, while I was simply sitting and relaxing, serve as an irrefutable evidence of the existence of the spiritual realm. I can't fathom any counter-argument that could dispute the plethora of sightings and experiences shared by fellow members of the subreddit. Therefore, I would be grateful to receive any insight or perspective from those that share my beliefs, or those who hold a divergent viewpoint. Let us delve deeper into this fascinating and enigmatic topic and explore the unknown realms of the existence beyond our mortal existence. Pregnancy, spiking activity. Throughout the generations of my family, a peculiar phenomenon has been observed. A recurring activity that happens every time someone in my family gets pregnant. It's as if the universe itself acknowledges the creation of the new life. And a subtle but palpable energy manifests in the environment. My parents have always recounted how they would hear three knocks and just feel a presence during both my sister and my time in the womb. But in recent times, there's been a significant increase in the paranormal occurrences in my household, and it's left me questioning the connection between the pregnancy and the spiritual realm itself. The inexplicable events that have transpired have left me unnerved and bewildered. One night while I was in the bathroom, I distinctly heard three sharp knocks on the door, which sent shivers down my spine. The air around me felt charged with an otherworldly energy and I had an unshakable sense of presence in my room. It was as if something or someone was trying to communicate with me. To my astonishment, my sister, who had recently announced her pregnancy at three months, experienced an even more intense encounter. She witnessed a crocodile being lifted up and dropped on its own, a sight that left her both terrified and mystified. This bizarre occurrence has only added to the strange and eerie events that have taken place in our home leaving us with many unanswered questions. As I pondered on this surreal turn of events, I couldn't help but wonder if there was a deeper meaning behind it all. Was pregnancy somehow connected to the paranormal world? And if so, what was the significance of the three knocks? Was there a message trying to be conveyed, or was it merely a coincidence? I turned to the knowledge of members of the subreddit for their insight to this unexplained phenomenon. Strange experience. Yesterday, as I lay on the upstairs couch hoping to take a nap, I felt myself slipping into a state of relaxation. My eyes were partly closed and I could see the beautiful colors of the sunlight filtering through my eyelids. As I faced the direction of my westward window, I saw something peculiar. There was a yellow colored shape and it seemed to be climbing through the second story window. At first, I thought it might be a trick of the light or maybe my imagination. But as the figure came into focus, I knew that it was real. The shape was almost three feet tall and had an unusual appearance. It was a bright yellow color and it seemed to glow in the sunlight and it stood out against the orange colored background. As it approached, I could see that it had horns, but they were more like those of a young bull. The shape also had a large droopy nose that made it appear somewhat comical. At this point, I opened my eyes completely, and to my surprise, there was nothing in the room with me. The window was closed, and there was no sign of the yellow shape that I had just seen. I tried to tell myself that it was a figment of my imagination, but I knew that what I had seen was real. I closed my eyes again, hoping to get some rest, but as soon as I did, I noticed the yellow shape moving closer to my spot on the couch. I began to feel uneasy, and I thought to myself, Please, not now, I'm too tired. 
The shape continued to approach until it was only a few feet away from me. I could see it clearly now, and I noticed that it was still waving at me with a friendly gesture. Just as I was beginning to feel afraid, the yellow shape suddenly stopped moving. It turned around slowly and began to walk back toward the window. As it climbed out, I saw it stop and wave at me one more time before disappearing below the windowsill. The whole experience left me feeling shaken and confused. I couldn't explain what I had seen, and I wondered if I had somehow fallen asleep and I was dreaming. But the memory of the yellow shape remained vivid in my mind, and I knew that what I had witnessed was real. I couldn't help but wonder what it all meant, and if I'd ever see the yellow shape again. Three Little Girls For as long as I can remember, I've been plagued by the presence of three little girls that seem to follow me wherever I go. This unnerving experience started when I was just two years old, and it's continued to occur sporadically for the last 15 years of my life. However, my concerns have escalated now that I'm a parent, and I find myself worrying about the safety of my firstborn child. One particular evening as I was settling down on the couch for a quiet night in, I closed my eyes and I tried to relax, but within moments the atmosphere around me changed dramatically. I heard an unmistakable sound of three distinct little girl voices giggling and whispering in unison. They asked me to come and play with them, and I was filled with a sense of terror that I couldn't shake off. Hoping that it was just my imagination or the sound of the television, I looked over at my mother who was sitting nearby in her chair and to my horror, I saw that she was wide awake and staring directly at me. My mother and I searched the entire house for any sign of intruder, but we found nothing unusual. So we went to bed, hoping that the experience was just a strange one-off occurrence. However, when I woke up in the morning, I discovered that I had scratches all down my side. This was just the beginning of the series of bizarre and explainable events that would occur over the years all of which involved the same eerie giggling in the appearance of these three little girls. As time passed, I found myself in a new home with my current wife, and even she has experienced this strange phenomena with me. The most recent occurrence happened just five years ago, but now I worry more than ever before as I've become a father to a beautiful five-month-old baby. The fact that these strange happenings have continued to occur despite my changing living situations, have left me feeling utterly perplexed and increasingly concerned for the safety of my family. I've scoured the internet and consulted with experts, but I've yet to find any satisfactory answers or explanations for what's happening to me. The only thing that remains certain is that the presence of these three little girls is very real, and their giggling and scratching have become a familiar and unnerving part of my life. I'm left with a sense of unease and trepidation, wondering what will happen next, and hoping that one day I'll find the answers that I seek. Shadow Dog opened my door. As I drifted off to sleep, little did I know that I was about to experience a harrowing and inexplicable encounter that would leave me questioning the very fabric of my reality. In the midst of my slumber, I saw a dark and ominous figure, a large black shadow dog with piercing red eyes, chasing something across my path. It was a surreal and terrifying sight, one that would have shaken anyone to their core. But what followed was even more perplexing. Suddenly, I was jolted out of my sleep by a loud slam and the gust of cold air rushing into my room. To my shock and horror, I found out that my patio door door that's never used at all due to its stickiness was wide open. I was utterly perplexed, as there was no rational explanation for how the door could have been opened. I live alone and there is no way anyone could have accessed the balcony from outside, and there were no stairs leading up to it. The wind was also not strong enough to have opened the door, let alone with force required to move such a sticky door. As I sat there stunned and bewildered, I began to contemplate the possibility of paranormal activity. Could it have been the shadow dogs that I had seen in my dream? Why would they need to open the balcony door in such a manner? What were they chasing? And what could these shadow dogs signify? 
These questions plagued me and I was left with an overwhelming sense of fear and unease. I never experienced anything like this before, and I didn't know how to make sense of it. I turned to the internet hoping to find others who had shared similar experiences, but no avail. As I delved deeper into the world of the paranormal, I realized that there were many theories and beliefs surrounding shadow dogs. Some that spoke of them as guardians, while others portrayed them as malevolent entities. The more I read, the more confused and scared I became. In the end, I was left with more questions than answers. What had I witnessed, and why had it happened to me? The experience shook me to my core, and I couldn't help but wonder if there was more to this world than what met the eye. My dog and I saw a suited man in the other room, again. It was a quiet night and I was sound asleep, when I was suddenly awoken by the sound of my dog barking frantically. My dog is usually very calm and sticks by my side, so her behavior was highly unusual. I sat up in bed and looked at my clock, which read 2 a.m. I was confused and a little bit scared, but I knew I had to investigate what was going on. As I got out of bed and made my way toward the living room, I could hear my dog digging frantically at the door. When I entered the living room, I was shocked to see a tall man in a dark suit standing there, staring directly at me. He had a distinctive look about him, like something straight out of a 50s detective film. I was terrified because someone was in my house, and I wasn't sure what to do. Quickly searched for my pepper spray and slowly moved toward the man, but before I could reach him, he suddenly vanished into thin air. My dog, however, kept digging and barking frantically as if she could still sense the presence of the mysterious intruder. I was confused and scared, so I went over to my dog to see what she was fixated on. I didn't hear or see anything unusual, but my dog continued to dig and bark at the same spot repeatedly. I tried distracting her with toys and treats, but she was completely disinterested, fixated only on the spot where the man had stood. It was strange and unnerving, especially given the 2 a.m. in the morning part. As I tried to calm my dog down, I couldn't help but feel an eerie feeling in the room. It was as if the man had left a lingering presence, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something unusual had just happened. My dog's unusual behavior and the strange man in the dark suit had left me shaken and scared, wondering if I was safe in my own home. What is this creature, half deer and half dog? Last night I experienced something truly bizarre and unsettling, and I'm hoping that someone on this forum can help me to understand what it is that I saw. I'm new to Reddit and I'm unsure of where else to turn, but I'm desperate for answers and explanations. I live in a house with a second story bedroom that has a deck outside the window, and it was on this deck that I saw the creature that has been plaguing my thoughts ever since. In the middle of the night, I awoke to find a creature standing outside my window, staring directly at me while I slept. It had the head of a large deer, but its body was that of a medium-sized black dog, standing about two feet tall on its hind legs. I felt an overwhelming sense of unease and discomfort as I looked at this strange and otherworldly creature. As there was no logical explanation for how it could have climbed up to the second story of my house, Feeling bewildered and disoriented, I vocalized my concern to my partner, asking why there was a deer staring at us through the window. But as soon as the words left my mouth, I realized that the eyes were not actually open. And that was not looking in my bedroom, but instead something else entirely. Despite this realization, I was fully awake and aware of my surroundings, able to move and speak with ease. This couldn't have been sleep paralysis, as I had full control over my body. To make matters worse, the creature disappeared just as quickly as it had appeared, leaving me feeling rattled and shaken. I spent countless hours researching the possibility of some sort of fey or other supernatural creature that might fit the description of what I saw, but I've yet to come across anything that fully explains my experience. The more I think about it, the more convinced I am that what I witnessed was not of this world, and that I may never be able to fully understand or explain what happened to me that night.
French Latin voice in my girlfriend's room while she sleeps. The story that I'm about to tell you is one that will send shivers down your spine and make you question the very foundation of your reality. It all started on Valentine's Day, when I decided to install a camera in my girlfriend's room. We were in a medium-distance relationship, and I wanted to be able to check up on her whenever I could. My girlfriend has struggled with mental issues her whole life, and I wanted to be there for her in any way that I could. She had mentioned feeling alone at times, and we both thought that installing a camera would be a good way for me to keep an eye on her, and for her to feel less alone. Additionally, she often had trouble sleeping and would have nightmares. I would be able to watch over her and call her if she was ever having bad dreams. For weeks, everything seemed to be going smoothly. I would check up on her every so often, and she seemed to be doing okay. But then about a week ago, something strange happened. I heard a singing voice coming from my girlfriend's room, a voice that sounded French or Latin in origin. It was a woman's voice, high-pitched and whispery, and it sounded malicious. The voice lasted the entire night, and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something truly sinister about it. What made it even more unsettling was the fact that there was an emphasis on certain words, as if the voice was trying to convey a message. I tried to record the sound, as I usually do, but for some reason I couldn't. It was as if the voice didn't want to be captured on film. My girlfriend's family originally came from France, and she used to be very spiritual, which only added to the sense of unease that I was feeling. As if it wasn't enough, I heard the voice again just a week later. This time, I knew it was something, and that it was seriously wrong. The voice sounded like a motherly figure, and then in words it spoke, it seemed to carry a deep and ominous meaning. I didn't know what to do. Should I tell my girlfriend? Would you think that I was crazy? Or is this some kind of supernatural occurrence that I couldn't explain? The more I thought about it, the more I realized that I was in over my head. As I sit here typing out the story, I can't help but wonder what'll happen next. Will the voice return? Will I be able to capture it on film? Or is this something that I'll never be able to explain or understand? Only time will tell. Have you seen those yogurt commercials with Jamie Lee Curtis? As near as I can tell, the primary appeal of the product is that it'll help you have a safe and happy bowel movement. That's fine, I suppose. It might be a major selling point for some people. But any time I see that particular brand of curdled dairy, all I can think about is, well, you get the idea. This is relevant, I promise. So, I'm at the grocery store one day, intent on purchasing the supplies necessary to make the most amazing BLT on the face of this planet. One such ingredient is cream cheese, which coincidentally tends to be stocked right next to the yogurt. As I was searching for the suitable supply, this odd rumble became audible almost like a growl of a wild animal laying in wait. At first, I ignored it, thinking it was nothing more than a piece of unseen machinery activating. But as it grew in volume, it took on a sense of being undeniably alive. I remember looking around, wondering if someone's service dog had detected a threat, but I was alone. That's when things got terrifying. The growl grew in intensity, and I could swear that I heard words accompanying it, saying something to the effect of, "'Cover you in shit!' As the last syllable was uttered, the yogurt exploded at me. Packages and serving-sized containers came flying off the refrigerator shelves, while the growling voice repeated, Cover you in shit! Suffice to say, it didn't help me and my association with that particular product, and it reduced me to a screaming mess. Someone must have heard the commotion because an employee came running in to check on me. When I described what had happened got this really nervous look on his face and apologized to me. There I was expecting to be chastised for vandalizing the display and learning based on the worker's reaction that this sort of thing had apparently happened before. Now when I've described this in the past, people have offered the suggestion that someone, maybe a crazy homeless guy, had gotten to the back of the store and was enacting a bizarre vendetta against yogurt. There's only one problem with this theory. The area suggested was one of the sort that was stocked from the front, not the back. Supposedly, there is nothing behind the shelves but a concrete wall.
ghosts operate under the laws of physics. When contemplating the concept of time travel, one must consider the intricacies of space and energy. It's not just a matter of traveling through time, but also traversing through different points of space. The idea that beings leave imprints and attachments of consciousness energy upon death is intriguing. These entities, commonly referred to as ghosts, exist purely as energy, leaving behind remnants of their presence that can be detected through electronics and conscious energy. But where exactly do these entities exist? Do they reside in our dimension, a parallel dimension, or within a certain spectrum of reality that our brains can't perceive through our filters? These are questions that have yet to be fully explored by mainstream science. As our planet and solar system move through space at an incredible speed of 500 plus thousand miles an hour, it's important to consider how these entities are bound by the laws of physics. Gravity, for example, is a force that can influence their movement as they travel through each space. But what other law of physics are they bound to? Which one do they transcend? The perception of time is another factor to consider. People from all over the world have used tools such as Ouija boards to communicate with these entities, summoning them from various points of space and time, including lower dimensions of existence. This raises questions about the existence of time as a linear construct and the potential for time travel through the manipulation of energy. It's fascinating to consider the possibilities and implications of this untapped field of knowledge, and it begs the question, why hasn't mainstream science explored this further? Perhaps it's time to open our minds to the mysteries that surround us and delve deeper into the unknown. The Abduction and Murder of Amy Mikhailievich Amy Mikhailievich was born on the 11th of December, 1978, in Little Rock, Arkansas. She was the second child of Mark and Margaret Mikhailievich, joining her older brother of three years, Jason. Looking to raise the children in a more idyllic Midwestern scene, Mark and Margaret moved their family to Bay Village, Ohio, a suburb full of promise for fulfilling their life. Mark found employment at a General Motors while his wife Margaret secured a job at the Trading Times magazine, and their two kids, Amy and Jason, entered the public schooling system. As Amy grew older, she found an interest in many hobbies and subjects, but nothing matched her love for animals, especially horses. This love soon spread to all mother of nature and the greater outdoors. Creating her own adventures around town, Amy became quite the explorer. Through her storytelling and fantasy, she brought her spirited imagination to life. At school, Amy's outgoing personality brought forth a number of friends. She was extremely social and affected those around her with her vibrant energy. She relentlessly exuded it. Just like her brother, Amy excelled academically in school, displaying a strong potential for a future in education. She also engaged herself in athletic activities both at school and around the Bay Village, becoming an avid swimmer as she grew into adolescence. Despite Amy's forward-thinking mind and social inclinations, she had not been keen to interact with adults. She would answer questions if asked directly or share a kind greeting, but didn't seek out elderly interaction. This aspect makes her tragic death all the more troubling. Disappearance Leading up to the 27th of October, 1989, Amy received a phone call from a mysterious caller who informed her that her mother, Margaret, had received a promotion at work. He had asked Amy if they could meet in a public place to buy a gift for Margaret. Amy agreed to the proposal before arranging a meeting at the shopping center at the Bay Village Middle School at the end of the week. Over the next few days, Amy told a few of her close friends at school about her meeting, thinking it would be completely innocent and nothing but a kind gesture for her mother. However, she didn't tell her parents about the man or the phone call, acting normally around the house. Early in the morning, at the hours of Friday, October 27th, Amy prepared for the upcoming school day, behaving casually and excited for the weekend. Before leaving, she informed her mother that she would be returning late, citing the audition for the fifth grade choir as her reason. At around 7.20 a.m., Amy departed for school on her bicycle, riding alone as Jason had already left. For the remainder of that morning, up until class was dismissed at 2.04 p.m., Amy spent the day as if it were any other Friday, 
exhibiting no signs of stress or worry. Eleven minutes later, Amy walked down the street from the middle school to the shopping center on the corner of Wolf Road, just across the street from the local police department. At 2.15 p.m., Amy was seen in the shopping center plaza by fellow classmates who were all hanging around an after-school recreational tradition. Soon afterward, Amy was approached by a 31-year-old white male standing around 5'9 and sporting brown hair. This would turn out to be the last confirmed sighting of Amy before disappearing from plain sight along with an adult male figure. Forty minutes later, Jason rang his mother from the residence, alerting her about Amy's absence. Assuming that Amy was probably still at her choir audition, Margaret asked Jason not to worry, but another alert from Jason 15 minutes later worried Margaret, causing her to gather up her things and prepare to leave work, and just at this moment she received a call from Amy. After a brief communication with her daughter, Margaret assumed that Amy had returned home safely, thus returning her to normal work. The next couple of hours trickled by, and Margaret couldn't shake the unsettling fear caused by her daughter's peculiar short replies. Letting her motherly instincts kick in, she packed up and left work in a rush, running to her car. At around 5.30 p.m., Margaret arrived home only to find Amy still absent. She began calling Amy's friends and the neighbors, desperate for any sightings or contact. Unable to locate her, Margaret hopped in her car and retraced her daughter's steps from earlier that day leading her to Amy's chained bicycle. Immediately afterward, Amy was officially reported missing. Search and Discovery Authorities were alerted and multiple search parties were formed. Countless Bay Village citizens canvassed the streets of their own innocent little lake town. The next morning, the Federal Bureau of Investigation arrived in Bay Village to assist the local law enforcement. The investigation was headed by Dick Wren, a special agent who was a Bay Village resident himself. Before the end of the morning, the police learned that one of Amy's schoolmates on one of her phone conversations was an unidentified male. Realizing that the abduction was not random but a predetermined plan, the schoolmate told the investigators that this man knew Amy's phone number, her address, her mother's employer, and even the time she would come home. He knew the area and could create trust in even the smartest children. This abductor was a force to be reckoned with. On October 28th, Howard Kimball, a longtime Bay Village resident, took charge of leading the volunteer search efforts for Amy. Searching up his own command post above City Hall and taking calls and tips from around the area. The late October weekend came to a close and investigators worried about their window of prime opportunity closing. Over the next hundred days, nothing of use was uncovered. Amy's profile was shared across multiple television programs and on various platforms, and yet, no one came forward with anything of substance. The next big find wouldn't come until the early morning hours of February 8, 1990, when the worst possible scenario unfolded. At around 7 a.m., a female jogger running alongside County Road 1181 in rural Ashland County, Ohio, noticed what appeared to be a body or a lump of clothes resting in a field near a pathway. Authorities were called, and the body was soon discovered to be Amy Mikhailievich. Near the crime scene were blankets and a shower curtain covered in Amy's family dog's hair. Investigation. An autopsy on Amy's body revealed her death to be a clear case of homicide. She had suffered multiple stab wounds to the neck and blunt force trauma to the head. Amy had at least one meal before her death, which most likely was an artificial chicken product, and it occurred only days after her abduction. Furthermore, the blood stains on her underwear suggest a possibility of sexual assault. The innocent young girl was murdered in cold blood, and her killer was on the loose. For the next three decades, Bay Village detectives and FBI led a massive manhunt for the Lake Erie murderer. In 2006, law enforcement learned that a few other girls in the city of North Olmsted, Ohio, received similar calls from an unidentified male figure at around every time Amy received hers. All of them were regarding buying presents for their mothers in similar setups to the one that led Amy's abduction. None of these girls had gone through with the scheme. This new piece of information signaled to police that they were dealing with a serial predator rather than a one-off criminal. After another seven years of inconclusive investigating, Special Agent Phil Torsney was brought on board. 
Phil told the reporters that the killer was most likely a longtime resident of northern Ohio, with in-depth knowledge of the local geography. Even today, authorities are still without any luck or noteworthy leads. Due to how exhaustively thorough they've been looking into the names, they've come up with over 15,000 interviews, 150 suspects, and 8,000 clues. Despite their commendable efforts, Amy's death is still frozen in a cloud of mystery. There are a few clues and missing artifacts sprinkled throughout the case that are worth magnification. First of all, there were three significant items missing from Amy's body on the day that her body was found. These personal artifacts were a pair of black horse riding boots, a denim backpack with an academic binder inside of it, with the slogan Best in Class written on the clasp, and a pair of turquoise earrings shaped like horse heads. These items were unique enough to make an impression on Amy's parents and distinguishable enough for the general public to be on the lookout. Detectives assigned to the investigation remarked about how predators in these types of crimes often keep mementos of their victims. These missing objects could easily have been held onto by the killer as a souvenir. If any of them could be found and identified, it could be a connection to Amy. The other peculiar point of interest was uncovered on November 2006, when multiple other girls came forward to investigators sharing similar stories of phone conversations with an unidentified man. While these girls were not friends of Amy directly, all of them had one conclusive connection to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. Detectives looked into the pattern and realized that the center utilized a visitor's log booth at the front door, which all of the girls, including Amy, had signed up to their trips there. Along with signatures, the logbooks also included visitors' phone numbers and addresses, giving the predator an in-depth resource for his potential victims' locations. How many logbooks in the center kept throughout its history, and if they're archived, is unknown. Sadly, the discovery wasn't made until 17 years after Amy's murder, and thus, going back and pinpointing suspects from any documents was nearly impossible. Theories and Suspects Involvement of Family As with many missing and murdered children's cases, one of the most argued theories at the beginning of the investigation was targeting the parents and their potential involvement. Fortunately, in Amy's case, authorities were able to quickly rule out both Mark and Margaret as suspects. They had both rock-solid alibis as they were both at work and around co-workers. Some conspiracy theorists have tried to reason that maybe the parents have hired someone to kidnap their daughter. However, the truth of the matter was that Amy's parents had nothing to gain from carrying out such a bizarre scheme. Most of the other early theories also revolved around friends and family members. These people most likely had knowledge of Margaret's employment situation, Amy's after-school routine, and the telephone number of her residence. They would have also known Amy's deep-rooted connection with her mother and her absolute will to do anything to make her happy. A child's compassion is usually seen and taken advantage of by people close to them, not by strangers or bystanders. However, all the possible people of interest closely connected to the Mihaljevic were intensely vetted by both the local police and the FBI, and none are currently considered prime suspects. Connections to the Holly Hills Farm There were a few promising individuals discovered by investigators through the first few years after Amy's body was found. The first was a former stable hand at Holly Hills Farm, where Amy would ride horses for recreation. His name was Sean Tabelli, and he was also going by Sean Dusky. Sean was kicked out of a previous labor position at a stable for tickling young girls. He was also accused of raping a 12-year-old girl in Washington in 1983. Another person connected via Holly Hills Farms was Dr. Gregory Capella, whose daughter also rode horses alongside Amy. He faced accusations of writing love letters to a female minor, asking to be her boyfriend, and he would also sleep in the same room as young girls when taking the youth soccer teams on trips to Canada. That being said, both of the Holly Hills Farms men profiled only had circumstantial suspicions at best and were never arrested. Connections to Memorial Events Another set of suspects would arise due to their involvement with Amy's memorial and the events held around the Bay Village soon after she disappeared. The first was Robert Jones, who attended a memorial service and handed Margaret $1,000 in cash. He didn't know the Mihaljevic family on a personal level, making the kind of transaction was a bit odd. Upon investigation, Robert's strange pattern of behavior was discovered. 
He had a penchant for standing nude in front of the living room window as young girls walked by. He was also suspected of arson when the home he lived in burned down in 1989. That being said, the FBI couldn't find anything useful while digging through his new home. The other peculiar subject targeted by police after Amy's memorial was an unarmed man featured in former FBI agent Robert Ressler's book, Whoever Fights Monsters. Ressler claimed that the man went out of his way to volunteer in search of searching for Amy, handing out flyers and going door to door. The man also sent Margaret sympathy cards with hairpins attached, telling her that she and Amy would wear them when Amy was found. Thinking it to be a sign of involvement, Ressler and another FBI agent visited the man to thank him for his volunteer efforts before turning it into an interrogation. While the man professed his innocence, the police kept checking in on him. They found he had a history of mental and emotional issues and felt that he had found their man. Their gut reaction seemed to be validated when the man combined a lethal dosage of ethanol with the soda just weeks after Amy's body was found. Ressler and the FBI attempted to search the residence after suicide, but before they could, the man's family and the house itself were cleaned and emptied. Years later, however, the local police told multiple investigators that there was very little evidence to suggest that this man could be the killer. A serial molester. There were also a couple of other men around the Bay Village area that exhibited disturbing histories with minors and young girls. One of them was Kenneth Robert Stanton, a serial molester who moved to northern Ohio in 1989. His modus operandi was befriending young girls, building up their trust, and invading their homes. Police later said Stanton was only a suspect due to his methods aligning with Amy's killer, but he had zero physical connection to her case. The other male figure was Dr. Frank Vacoon, a local Bay Village dentist who exhibited an interest in female minors. He moved out of the country shortly after Amy was kidnapped, and those who knew him told reporters that he asked his family to send him updates about Amy's case. What happened to Frank is unknown, but some say that he had beaten his wife and fled to Costa Rica. Dean Runkle Out of all the men investigated, interviewed, and implicated in Amy's case, none stand out more than one suspicious figure researched by longtime journalist and expert on the case, James Renner. In November of 2008, Renner published an article titled Person of Interest, detailing the history of his personal search for a man by the name of Dean Runkle. Dean Runkle wasn't just a character of the northern Ohio suburbs with vague connections to the Mahuyevic family or a semi-shady past. Rather, Dean was the first and most prolific suspect, intersecting with all of the girls who received strange calls from an unidentified man in the late 1980s. He worked as a volunteer at the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center in 1989. But none of the former employees of the center had remembered his name until a man named Tom Pachensky called up Renner in August of 2008. The man told Renner that his former 8th grade science teacher in 1991, Dean Runkle, would talk about the Lake Erie Science Center to his classes. This was the volunteer booth that Renner and the FBI wanted to investigate, and thus, the profiling endeavors began. Dean Runkle was born in the mid-1940s in New London, Ohio, on a farmhouse only a few miles away from where Amy's body would be found. He lived in a turbulent early life, dealing with an abusive father and the tragic death of his six-old twin sister in 1950. Nevertheless, he went on to develop a love for science and biology and studied at Bowling Green State University. Soon after graduation, he found employment at a seventh-grade science instructor at Vermilion Junior High School in 1967. Dean was a colorful individual who implemented film and photography with his students. This habit seemed to run deeper into his private life as he would take videos and photos of his students and cut and develop the film. When he wasn't teaching, Dean took time to play ragtime piano at venues around the country, including Disneyland. By the time he returned to teaching, Dean Runkle assembled a miniature conservatory in his classroom with various animals and creatures. This led to involve his students even more outside the lectures, calling them his assistants and allowing them to spend time in his home after school. Citing health concerns, Dean abruptly quit his position in 1987. He moved back to New London and worked at a pet store, delivering mice to nature centers around the area, including the Lake Erie Science Center. It didn't take long before Dean secured another teaching position at the Nord Junior High School, where he built another miniature zoo and used students in his after-school assistance. 
Once more, he quit out of the blue, but this time without any apparent reason. Curious about Dean's personality and the relationship with his students, Brenner reached out to over 500 of his former middle schoolers, now adults in the real world. By all accounts, he heard back a lot of positive feedback regarding Dean's infectious energy. However, he also received a fair share of secrets revealing a darker side of Dean and a pattern of disturbing behavior. First were the stories of animal cruelty. For one instance, he had pulled a prank on a friend by dipping a cat in liquid nitrogen, freezing it and letting it crash into multiple pieces on the floor. Then there were copious instances of creepy incidents with the kids. One female student recounted his inappropriate behavior with minor girls. Another male student recalled his propensity for telling sexual jokes to the boys, going as far as to hint that he liked kids before they hit puberty. Another former female student thought Dean was the closest match to a police sketch of Amy's kidnapper. While she confronted him, his eyes popped out of his head before he walked past without saying anything. Another one of Dean's female students came forward with a disgusting revelation. She claimed to overhear Dean tell a couple few administrators that he wished he was the father of a baby held by a pregnant 8th grader. One of the most glaring pieces of evidence against Dean is an incident that occurred with another student of his, in which they were caught alone in Dean's gold-colored Pontiac. Both the school's principal and the police were aware of the situation, but let Dean off with nothing more than a warning. Amy's body was found with a microscopic gold fiber, researched to be those of a GM automobile, most likely a model for the mid to late 1970s. Dean's gold-colored Pontiac fell in line with this clue. Renner tried to track it down, maybe to a junkyard, but the car had already been scrapped. When Renner carried out this investigation in 2008, he paid a visit to Dean in Key West, Florida, where Dean had fled in 2003 before managing a fast food restaurant. Dean vehemently denied any involvement with Amy or her murder, saying that he always cooperated with the FBI, including taking lie detector tests. Furthermore, he claimed he was always at school after hours and he wouldn't have time to go shopping, and abduct Amy so soon after the final bell. While the evidence is circumstantial at best, the clues and patterns associated with Dean definitely suggest something more sinister could have been at play. However, there's an equal chance Dean didn't do the kidnap and didn't kill Amy. Those who described Amy's captor described him as having dark brown hair, but Dean's hair is a dirty blonde. Conclusion Was Dean Runkel the man responsible? It's certainly possible, but so too are any of the other names that the FBI listed in their investigation. The killer could have also been somebody that nobody expected. Someone who became so invisible that his face was never even considered. Not even the police sketches of the abductor give us a concrete answer, as law enforcement has said that the drawing is a simple estimation and likely inaccurate. Thus, the only road to justified conclusion will probably be if DNA evidence is ever procured and linked to a particular individual. Police did find partial hairs not belonging to either Amy or her family on her body and these have been recently submitted for DNA analysis. However, without the root of the hair, a full DNA profile might not be possible. Unfortunately, considering that they're over three decades old, the crime itself, and possibly the finding of Amy's killer, seems to be dwindling as the future rolls on. I think there's something following me. Lately I've been experiencing a range of inexplicable sensations that have left me feeling confused, unsettled, and even a little bit frightened. It all started with a persistent tapping on my left shoulder that seemed to linger there for what felt like an eternity, making it impossible to ignore. The sensation was so persistent that I began to wonder whether there was something physically wrong with me, but I couldn't seem to find any explanation for it. Over time, the tapping continued, but with greater intensity. I began to feel something else, something that was hard to describe. It was like an impact, a soft punch that didn't really hurt, but left a strange feeling in its wake. It was as if something was trying to get my attention to communicate with me in some way that I couldn't quite understand. As if this wasn't enough, I began to hear whispers and see movements out of the corners of my eyes. My belongings were also being moved from where I left them, 
making me feel as if I was going crazy. I tried to rationalize the situation, thinking that maybe perhaps it was just my imagination running wild and I was experiencing just some kind of mental illness, but I'd never had any problems like this before. I got to the point where these experiences started to impact my daily life, and I knew that I had to do something about it. I began to research possible explanations for what was happening to me, but I couldn't find anything that made sense. I decided to try to ignore the sensations and movements, hoping that they would eventually go away on their own, but they persisted, and I knew that I had to take on more drastic measures. Finally, I made the decision to see a doctor and get my mental and physical health checked. I knew that it was possible that I was suffering from some kind of mental illness or maybe there was something physically wrong with me that was causing these experiences. I was pretty scared and unsure of what to expect, but I knew that I had to take action. After some time, most of the experiences stopped, but I still intended to follow through with my plans to get my mental and physical health checked. I want to make sure that this isn't a one-off occurrence and that I'm taking care of myself in every way possible. I hope that by sharing my story, others may be, may be experiencing similar sensations and movements and will feel less alone and know that they're not going crazy. I heard that the NDSU is haunted. Has anybody had any experiences? To begin, I'm an amateur journalist. I began writing stories and short poems a few years ago after meeting a man who soon became my best friend, and who also vanished from my life soon after. Some of my works I had submitted to my former high school English professor for assignments. She informed me about the opening at the local newspaper where I began my career as a journalist. A few months before writing this article, I had moved to North Dakota. This is the first time I've lived in a different state other than South Dakota, my homeland. I find it fascinating that out of seven children in my family, I was the last one to have ever left the state. After moving to the Rough Rider state, I began looking for a job. I took a couple months to do it, and during that time, I began to get very close to death by boredom. I believe my cat was the one thing that kept me sane throughout the struggle I faced. I've always been interested in paranormal or unknown things. I guess you could say, and after being unemployed for some amount of time, I ran out of shows to binge watch and scary YouTube videos to view. I began wondering if there were any abandoned buildings with creepy histories or haunted properties that I could learn about. So, like any young person nowadays, I took to the internet and googled it. I typed in the search bar, haunted locations in my area. From there, I scrolled down, clicking on any trustworthy looking links and websites. I was mainly looking for properties and buildings that looked run down and very old, but I found something else. A college campus rumored to be haunted by a man who hung himself during World War II and several murder victims and supposed suicides. That college was North Dakota State University. And that's where this begins. Sari's Hall. At 1301 Administration Avenue in Fargo, North Dakota, Sari's Hall was the first woman's dormitory on the North Dakota Agricultural College campus. The building was renovated to accommodate 50 women. Now, the building is also home to the Office of Administration, Career and Advising Center, Enrollment Management, and other services. We all know that life as a student can be a struggle, and the weight of having perfect grades can hang heavy on our shoulders. One of the ghosts that reportedly haunts the Sari's Hall is a young female student. It's rumored that she took her life by hanging herself on the third floor due to having poor grades. It's also rumored that the third floor is where a man hung himself from the heating pipe during the Second World War. While neither of these deaths have been verified by a reliable source, they sure do add some excitement to student life on campus. It's said that the basement and the third floor are locations of the most supernatural activity in the Ceres Hall. At night, you're able to hear the slamming of doors up and down the hallways of the third floor, loud noises making their way through the night, and lights going out engulfing entire floors in complete darkness. Students have reported feeling a strange and uneasy presence around them as well. Upon entering the basement, some people have experienced feeling panicked, and under duress in 2007, a paranormal crew of FM Paranormal conducted an investigation, 
Sean O'Donnell and Charles Dosh brought along cameras and recording equipment to document their experiences. O'Donnell recalls seeing a shadow near one of the doors moving in and out. Upon further inspection, he found that by the area in the wall where the shadow was, it was very cold. Dosh started that the team had heard whispers from the corners and had witnessed a red ball of light in the area of the basement. Minard Hall At 1210 Albrecht Boulevard in Fargo, North Dakota, Minard Hall was originally named Science Hall. It was to be built in three stages, and among the offices and departments located in this hall are biology, geology, horticulture, anthropology, and NDSU press. The 1902-03 NDAC catalog described Science Hall as one of the most artistic buildings on campus, being well lit and ventilated and finished with quarter sawed oak. In the 1920s, dances were held on the fourth floor of the Science Hall. A rumor has been going around that since that time, one morning after Dance Hall had been held, a janitor went to the fourth floor to give away its daily cleaning. Upon entering, he discovered two murder victims. Just like the two fateful stories told before, I was unable to verify the truth behind this one, but nevertheless, it adds to the excitement. In 2009, part of Menard Hall had collapsed, due to being built on top of weak clay, leaving a gaping hole in the middle of the structure. In return, NDSU had received more than $3 million in damages. While the damages have been repaired since the collapse, students are still reporting feelings of uneasiness radiating from the fourth floor. It's advised that you do not go there on your own and investigate during the night. While many pass these stories off as just legends, others like myself would like to believe there's some truth behind them. I plan on one day exploring these two buildings in hope of experiencing the ominous feelings of being watched, the slamming of doors when no one's behind them, or quiet whispers coming from the back of the room. But until that day comes, I'll have to entertain myself with only the possibilities. Creepy Things Happening in a Graveyard on the night of April 13th, 2020, a friend and I were walking past a graveyard that I had been in several times before, during the daytime, but never at night. Not for any specific paranormal reason, just I don't want to go into secluded areas at night. I looked into the graveyard from behind a one meter high wooden fence that surrounded it, and I saw something strange. The area surrounded by trees and gravestones, but I swear I saw the outline of a person. I think he was wearing a black suit from the glimpse I got, as well as black pants and a black hat. But it was extremely hard to tell, and it could have been any color, just not visible in the black of night. My first instinct was maybe a person paying their respects late at night, and then I saw the shadow walk behind a large tree. In the direction that he was walking, I should have seen him walk back into my view on the other side of the tree, but he didn't. I asked my friend and we decided to investigate. We walked a bit to get a quick view of behind the tree. Unless the person had ran, we should have been able to see him walking away or standing behind the tree, but we didn't. It was almost as if he had vanished. We walked into the graveyard, which by the way had cameras, and it was legal to walk into 24-7, and walked up to the tree. Behind the tree was an unmarked grave, no headstone, but a single rose that looked fresh, not wilted at all. Now obviously, we chalked it up to a normal person, nothing paranormal about it. I guess he just slipped out of our field of view and went far away enough that we couldn't see him. Then we realized our footprints were clearly visible in the dirt around where he was standing, but his weren't. We came back the next night for shits and giggles and saw the same figure, same height, same clothing, at the same spot. The same spot that we were when I had caught a glimpse of the man standing next to the same tree. It appears as if he had turned his head at us, then back in front of him and walked behind the tree again. We did the same thing. We walked back up behind the tree and didn't find any sign of him, despite the fact that it was like 30 second walk and the pace at which someone walks in 30 seconds shouldn't put him outside of our field of view. No footprints or disturbed dirt and the rose was gone, even though I'd visited earlier in the day to attempt to photograph the grave and it was still there. 
my friend said it was very strange that maybe it had been a real person. We caught him two nights in a row at the same spot. At different times of the night, too. We went there two nights in a row and nothing. Didn't see him again after that. Had we just caught a ghost in a graveyard? I guess we'll never know. Encounter with Bill Apani. I've been a geocacher for over 10 years, and it's used to be pretty popular in the Czech Republic. Lots of people hid caches to spread awareness or to pay respects to old buildings or those who have passed. About eight years ago, I came across a cache on my map. It was the cache of Panabila. Some background information. Bila Pani, or White Lady, is believed to haunt Sesky Kromlov, which is the town in the Czech Republic. The legend says that the White Lady appears in and around the castle of Kromlov Castle, which is located in the town. The White Lady is the ghost of Percha Rosenberg, a noblewoman who lived in the castle during the 16th century. She appears as a white figure walking in the area, and her presence is a sign of impending disaster or death. Every geocache has instructions on where, how, and when to find them, as some can only be seen at specific times. This cache, however, came with instructions to go absolutely not at night. It was believed that Panabila roamed the area and demands silence on her property. Being there at night would disturb her rest, and there's not something that you want to do or want to be responsible for. Being the skeptic thrill, thrill seeker that I was, I wanted to go right away. Because who's going to be there to stop me? A dead woman in a nightgown? Well, not exactly, but I did want to witness something. I was in the woods surrounding the castle. I always took my dog with me when I went into the woods. I take him for the night walk, and he loves and he scares boars away. Win-win, right? I was using the GPS device that I always take with me during cache hunting. It was more accurate than the app back then. It was working fine until at one moment it just went a little crazy. I'm not talking about it being a little off. The game was to find the coordinates, and then he still had about a 30 meter range to actually look for the cache. So that would have been pretty normal. I'm talking about a device sending me hundreds of meters in a direction just after it told me I'm 20 meters away from the given coordinates. I reset it because I thought it was just an error, but it kept doing the same thing. Just every time I reset it, it was a different number. Since I was just a few meters away from the location, I decided to just count my meters since I knew it was like 20 meters, until I suddenly felt chilly. Note that it was midsummer, and even though it was at night, it was still around 25 degrees. There was no wind and I wasn't tired or anything. And even if it was wind, it would have been warm. I eventually turned my ass around after my dog started squeaking. And I'm telling you that dog was a beast. May his kind fluffy soul rest in peace. He wasn't scared of anything. And if there was a person or animal near at night, he would bark and growl, not squeak and keep his tail behind his legs. I decided to leave because I thought maybe my dog wasn't well but I wanted to take a picture at least, because at least it would be cool if it was there at night, planning to go back during the day. I remember thinking, haha, my battery's at 69%. I know I'm a douchebag. Anyway, when I got out of the woods and found my car parked to the side, my dog was completely fine. He wasn't tired, hungry, or unwell at all. Not only that, I checked my GPS again in fear of having to throw it away because it broke or something. It worked perfectly. Lastly, my phone battery was at 20%. Safe to say that I started to question my beliefs a little bit at this point, especially when I wanted to take a look at the picture. They were all corrupted. That one time when a voice helped me on an exam. Once upon a time, not so long ago, I found myself in an unfamiliar situation. I had to take a highly significant exam at a different school under the supervision of teachers I'd never met before. The exam syllabus had been disclosed to us beforehand, but the catch was that each of us had to randomly select a topic from a paper that we had to pull out of a container. Standing second in line, I was suddenly jolted by a voice that shattered my composure. Pull the first one. My senses went numb and I tried to act cool, as if nothing had happened. 
However, the voice persisted. What are you waiting for? Pull the first one. My mind raced with questions. Who was this person? Why was he or she so insistent? What was the significance of pulling the first paper? With trepidation, I blurted out, But why? Can't you tell me the reason? Stop wasting time and pull the paper. Thinking to myself that I was better to comply than to create a scene, with troubling hands I reached for the first paper. And as I unfolded it, a sense of incredulity engulfed me. The question was so straightforward and uncomplicated that I felt as if I was engaged in a casual conversation rather than a crucial exam. To my surprise, I realized that this topic was not part of the curriculum that had been shared with us. Incredibly, I found myself answering the question with ease and scoring a perfect 100%, something I'd never imagined. This experience taught me that sometimes the unexpected can lead to pleasant surprises and that things are not always what they seem. The Funeral Crasher It's with great sorrow that I share this heartbreaking story of my son's untimely death. As fate would have it, neither I nor my ex-husband had many friends or close relatives. So when it came time to bid farewell to our beloved child, there were only about ten people in attendance. The funeral was held at my ex-mother-in-law's house, where her son was cremated, surrounded by those who had known him for years. However, something strange happened at the funeral that still haunts me to this day. About a week after the event, numerous people started asking me about a strange lady that they had claimed to have seen at the funeral. According to their accounts, she was incredibly tall and didn't introduce herself by a name. She spoke briefly to a couple of people and then vanished without saying goodbye. Shockingly, some of these people even swore to me that they had spoken to her, but couldn't remember the details of the conversation. At first, I thought that the strange lady might just be my adoptive mother, but when I showed them her picture, it became clear that it wasn't her. She also confirmed that she had not attended the funeral based on the people she had spoken to. I stayed in the kitchen almost half the entire time, barely interacting with anyone due to obvious reasons, and only stepped out for the five-minute outdoor event. Even then, I only answered a few questions about the food and service timing. To this day, I still have no clue who the strange lady was, or why she showed up at the funeral. It remains a mystery and I can't shake the feeling that I might have missed out on an important conversation that could have brought me some closure in the aftermath of my son's death. Despite my best efforts, I'm left with more questions than answers, and the memory of that day still haunts me. For nearly two years, my husband has taken the same route to work twice a day, every day. We've become so accustomed to the scenery along the way that we hardly pay attention anymore. But one day we noticed something out of the ordinary. A large house, squeezed between two smaller houses, looking completely out of place. We briefly discussed it, but then forgot about it. A few days later on our way home from work, we remembered the strange house and decided to take a slow drive past it. But when we reached the spot where it should have been, it was nowhere to be seen. We drove up and down the road five or six times, but it was as if the house had vanished into thin air. The two smaller houses that had been sandwiched between were still there, but the large house was gone. Days went by and my husband passed the spot again, alone this time. He took more time to look around, and to his surprise, the house had reappeared. This time, he noticed some distinct features large columns and a specific-looking witch window. There was no mailbox or address number anywhere in sight, and there was never any furniture, and the porch curtains and the windows were drawn. It was unlike any of the prefab houses around it, and it gave us an eerie feeling. Since then, the house has continued to appear and disappear sporadically, almost as if it's playing a game of hide-and-seek with us. We've never been able to catch it at the same time twice, and we still haven't managed to snap a photo of it, but tonight we'll try again since it was there and we drove by earlier. This mysterious house has become a constant source of fascination and intrigue for us, and we can't help but wonder about its origins and its purpose.
gifts from the universe. There have been instances in my life where I've intentionally given away items, only to have them reappear in my possession in unexplainable ways. The first occurrence was with the blanket and the pillow that my mother had made for my daughter. Knowing I would never see her again, I only gave her the pillow and kept the blanket for myself. Recently, while thinking about my departed son and daughter, I retrieved the blanket only to find the pillow with it, despite having no logical reason to be there. Another experience involved a baby bed and a mobile that I had carefully selected for my younger son. After he outgrew it, I gave it away to a stranger in need. Months later, during a particularly difficult time while in a custody battle with my ex, I found one of these three bears from the mobile sitting in my washing machine. I can't explain how it got there. The most perplexing occurrence was with a decorative belt that belonged to my grandmother. Though I was not particularly close to her, I ended up with the belt and gave it away multiple times, even throwing it away, only to have it reappear in my possession again and again. While I'm saddened by these events, I can't help but wonder if there's any sign or something greater. Perhaps these items are returning to me as a message that I need them more than I realize. I'm also curious if anyone else has had similar experiences and what their opinion is on the matter. Time Lost Let me tell you a bizarre tale that's been haunting me since the American Easter yesterday. You see, I have a peculiar habit of sleeping in shorts or nothing at all. Locked in my room and entirely alone, it's an essential routine that I follow diligently. Now coming back to yesterday, we begin the typical Easter celebrations around 11 and continue until approximately noon. We did everything from egg hunts to Easter baskets, from dying eggs to lunch, and all the traditional Easter things, but something strange happened that I still can't explain. I distinctly remember the egg hunt and the Easter baskets, but the next thing I knew, I was standing in the middle of the room in nothing but my sleep skivvies. It was already 4 p.m. and everyone was staring at me in disbelief. What's more strange is that I have no memory of the four hours in between. Despite the presence of trash in the bin, I have no recollection of the cleanup. Although there were dyed eggs all around, I have no memory of dyeing them. And although everyone insisted that I ate lunch, I have absolutely no memory of it whatsoever. It's not just my imagination playing tricks on me. No less than four people corroborated my story, and there were no drugs or alcohol involved. So the question that haunts me is, what happened? What could have caused such a bizarre memory lapse? I'm left with more questions than answers and a sense of unease that lingers. It's a strange Easter indeed. A ghost of my sister who is still alive. Fifteen years ago, I had an eerie encounter that stayed with me ever since. At the time, I lived in a haunted apartment, and I had played with the Ouija board a few times. Many paranormal incidents occurred during the stay there, which still leaves me shaken and fascinated by the unknown, and this led me to start a paranormal podcast to explore such phenomena further. I vividly remembered the night when I was about 14 and alone at home. I was sitting at the family desktop computer engrossed in my work when I felt a sudden presence behind me. I turned around to find someone who looked like my older sister, but dressed in 1800s attire, staring at me intently. To my horror, I realized that it couldn't be my sister since she was alive and well. I was paralyzed with fear and couldn't bring myself to move for the rest of the night. For years, I tried to rationalize what had happened. I thought about every possibility, including whether it could have been a deceased family member who resembled my sister, or if she had a twin who didn't make it. Despite my attempts to find answers, I'm still left with an unsolved mystery that haunts me to this day. I'm curious if anyone else has had a similar experience, or any insight into what might have happened that night. Perhaps there's more to the paranormal world than what we can perceive, and encounters like this may offer a glimpse into the unknown. As I continue to explore and investigate paranormal activity through my podcast, I hope to uncover more mysteries and connect with others who have had similar experiences.
Any stories of haunted malls from retail workers or ex-retail workers? Have any of you ever experienced the eerie feeling of a haunted mall in LA? Specifically, have you ever heard of the Fox Mills Hall? If not, I'm eager to hear any stories from ex-retail or current retail workers who have worked there or who may have seen or felt something out of the ordinary. This might seem like a very specific scenario, but as someone who used to work in retail, I can attest to the fact that one of the mall locations I worked at was undoubtedly haunted. Of course, it's not uncommon for jobs with basements or an eerie backroom situation to have an unsettling atmosphere, but this was something else entirely. The basement under the mall was a particularly creepy spot, and even on my very first day of working there, I heard people talking about the strange experiences that they had encountered while down there. I myself had a few encounters that left me shaken. There was something about the atmosphere down there that just didn't feel right. It was as if the air itself was thick with an unexplainable presence. One day I was down in the basement doing inventory when I heard footsteps coming from the opposite end of the room. I assumed it was another worker, but I called out to them, no one answered. The footsteps continued getting louder and closer, but when I turned around, no one was there. Another time, I was walking up the stairs from the basement when I heard someone whisper my name. It was a faint, barely audible sound, but it was enough to send shivers down my spine. I turned around, but again, there was no one there. I wasn't the only one who had experienced these strange occurrences. Other workers had seen shadowy figures moving around the basement and heard unexplainable noises, felt an inexplicable sense of unease. The strange thing was that these occurrences didn't seem to be limited to the basement. There were reports of odd happenings throughout the mall. It's hard to explain what made the Fox Mills Hall so haunted. Perhaps it was the location. Or maybe there was something sinister lurking in the walls. Whatever the cause, it was clear that this was no ordinary mall. Even now, years later, I still get chills thinking about the strange encounters I had while working there. So the fridge did a thing. Let me share with you a rather unusual incident that happened to me this morning while I was preparing breakfast in my kitchen. Everything seemed normal until I heard a strange fiddling sound that seemed to be coming from behind me. I didn't pay much attention to it and I assumed that it was just my fridge making its usual noises. However, the sound persisted and suddenly I heard a loud click. I quickly turned around to see what was happening and to my surprise, the little door of my fridge was wide open, but this little door is something we hardly ever use. It's only big enough to store cans or bottles, and we don't even keep our eggs in the fridge. But if you need to use it, you just have to press a button and it'll open. To close it, you push it until it clicks into place. I was taken back by this sudden occurrence, and as I turned back towards the kitchen door, I saw it slowly lowering down until it was completely open. I pushed it closed and walked out of the kitchen, feeling perplexed by what had just happened. It was as though the fridge and the door were conspiring to get my attention. This event reminded me of another time when something equally bizarre had happened to me. It was almost impossible, like defying gravity. I can't help but wonder if there's some sort of supernatural force at work here, or if it's just a strange coincidence. Either way, it left me with the feeling unsettled and perplexed. Please explain this. I think this ghost gave me a hickey. A long time ago when I was on a cruise with my family for my 15th birthday, something bizarre happened that still baffles me to this day. It was 2019 and we were traveling from Australia to the southern parts of New Zealand and back again. During the first week of the trip, I spent a lot of time in the youth programs with other teens and didn't return to my cabin until almost midnight or 11. My cabin was connected to my parents' room and my brothers and I shared a room. When I got back, my mom was still awake and quickly lectured me about the late hour. My brother was already fast asleep and I was fine in the shower, but when I looked in the mirror to brush my teeth, I noticed a dark red hickey on my collarbone. It was about the size of someone biting into an apple. It freaked me out. 
I remembered shaking, freaking out, but I went to bed anyway. The next day, I told my mom about it, and she was just as startled and confused as I was. We didn't mention it to my dad or brother and left it to rest, continuing to enjoy our trip. It's been four or five years since that incident, and I've started thinking about it again recently. I've tried to retrace my steps and think of everything that's happened prior to the incident, but I'm left with nothing that makes sense. Even though I try to be a skeptic and find a reason for what happened, can't explain it. I'm hoping that someone reading this, or hearing this, in this case, might be able to shed some light on this strange and unsettling event that's stuck with me all these years. My daughter was born with mild tracheomalacia, a soft windpipe. The only trouble it ever caused was that she would make a whistling sound sometimes when she was breathing, especially when she was excited or upset. Fast forward to when she was about four months old and fast asleep in her crib one evening. Her older brother had the stomach flu that day and had been throwing up. We thought the baby hadn't caught it, but a little while after we put her to bed, we suddenly heard her softly sputtering on the monitor. Then silence for a few seconds, then a huge loud wail, which made both my husband and I run even faster to her room. By the time we got to her, she had fallen eerily quiet again. We saw that she was gasping for air, choking and unable to clear the vomit from her throat and get a clean breath. Even after we picked her up and cleared her mouth, she continued to gasp. She turned blue and then gray. As I drove with her quickly to the ER, she had partially recovered by the time we got there. They gave her O2, a chest x-ray, then a clean bill and we left. Fast forward about two hours later when I'm back in my bedroom with her sleeping upright in the baby seat next to me in bed. My husband and I talked briefly about what would have happened had the baby not cried out so loudly. Would we have reacted so quickly? Would she have recovered? I'm in and I'm about to sleep myself because I kept checking her. One of the times just before I'd fully awoken, I looked out in the hallway and saw my grandfather who had passed away a few years prior. When he was alive, he wasn't the most involved granddad, but when he met my husband, my boyfriend at the time, they had an instant connection. When he passed away, his last coherent words were, I'm not going to make it to Altruitus in Mr. Altruitus' wedding. Am I? He loved my husband dearly. Anyway, I see him out in the hall this night, and he's just standing there in khakis and a polo, with his hands in his pockets. In my dream state, I see all my children except the baby, pulling at his arms and playing with him. He has a simple smile on his face. He looks over towards the baby's room, back at me, and says, I'm sorry I made her cry, but I'm glad she's okay. I have a friend, let's call her Jane. And she knows someone who owns a small business. This business is located in an old house, and there had been reports of strange occurrences happening within the office. The owner, suspecting that the place was haunted, decided to hire a team of ghost hunters to investigate. Skeptical Jane asked to join, and so she was present when the ghost hunters arrived. The ghost hunters went through the business with their instruments, pointing out the hot spots and cold spots in the building. Jane was unimpressed by their methods, but things got interesting when the ghost hunters decided to put a radio on scan and ask questions to the supposed ghost. They received clear responses to their queries, even though the radio was scanning through static and intermittent talking. The first question asked was, Has anybody died in this house? And the voice on the radio answered, Six people. The ghost hunters continued their line of questioning, and the answers became more and more specific. When asked how they had died, the voice on the radio responded with a chilling answer, Fire. The business owner then asked, Why are you messing with my staff? To which the voice replied, My staff. As the session went on, the ghost hunters noticed that the voice on the radio was getting agitated. They suggested stopping, but the business owner wanted to ask one more question. 
However, when he did, the voice on the radio shouted, No more questions, in a loud and clear tone. Jane, who remained skeptical throughout the experience, was genuinely frightened and disturbed by what she had heard. She admits that there must be some sort of explanation for what had happened, but she, along with everyone else, remains completely clueless as to what it could be. The mystery of the haunted office continues to creep them out. Paranormal Activity on M.T. Ranch The ranch in question is massive, covering about 18 sections. A section is one square mile, or 640 acres, and it's two-thirds deeded, with the rest being either BLM or state-owned. This land is incredibly rugged, being covered in clay hills and deep canyons, and is for the most part unfenced. There are several buffalo jumps on the ranch, where hundreds of years ago, the Indians would chase herds of buffalo off cliffs to their deaths. You can still find buffalo bones at these sites. Supposedly, the ranch was also the site of a massacre, where an entire village of Hidatsa were killed by their enemy. Although, I haven't found any actual records of that incident. Also on the ranch are two abandoned homesteads. The Mint Place and the Carter Place. These are fake names as the families still live in the area, and I want to keep their information private. The Mint Homestead is merely one mile off of the county road and relatively easy to access, so my brother and I still use his dated cattle pens that are a part of it. The Carter Place is more remote, however, only being accessible by horseback as the trail that went on washed out many years ago. All that's left of the Carter Place is a log cabin with the roof caving in, an old corral system, and a barn that's toppled over. The last people that lived in the Carter house were the Carter family themselves. But during the 1930s, the father went crazy and murdered the entire family before turning the gun on himself. At least, that's what people said. The ranch's current owner lives in California, and they've owned the ranch since purchasing it from the Mint family, sometimes during the 1980s. My brother and I began leasing the ranch in 2007. There was some unusual activity at first, mainly random lights, but nothing that couldn't be explained in a reasonable way. The strangeness began in 2017, after a well was drilled on the property. I wonder now if this may have unleashed something. During the fall of 2017, I was searching for strays on horseback when I was approached by two frantic hunters. These hunters claimed that they were being stalked by a pack of wolves. But I was dismissive, as there had not been a wolf in this area since the 1920s. The hunters claimed that they knew there was a difference between wolves and coyotes, and they were obviously certain that what was stalking them were wolves. Whatever it was had seriously bothered them. Later in the year, when we were trucking cattle away from the ranch and back to the home place, we found out that there were a dozen head short. Despite us running 600 cattle on the property, we kept very close tabs on the herd, and it was unusual to lose more than two. But no matter how many times we searched and recounted, we couldn't find the missing cattle. This began a trend, and so far since 2017, there's been a total of 138 unaccounted for cattle, a financial loss of 165 grand. Though there are many odd events that I could recount, there is one that stands out. This took place in October 2020. Myself, my brother, and my brother's eldest son were gathering the cattle and herding them into the Mint Homestead, where they could be loaded onto trucks and taken to our home ranch for the winter. By this point, the weird activity on the ranch had increased, so much so that we never went on the ranch without being armed. This day was no exception, and strapped to the saddle under my left leg was a Winchester 3030 rifle. The morning went well, and by noon we had gathered 200 head, which we penned up at the mint place. After eating a quick lunch, my brother and nephew loaded their horses and left. My nephew had a football game later that day. I stayed alone and rode northwest toward the Carter homestead. The first strange thing to happen was when I rode down the canyon. 
As I was riding, I could hear multiple howls and cries coming from all directions. I can't describe what these howls sounded like, because they were like nothing I'd ever heard before or since. As I continued riding into the canyon, I was overcome with a feeling of dread. My horse Ace seemed to pick up on this as well and began spooking at almost every shadow. This was very out of character for him, as he was usually a very calm and collected horse. The second strange thing was when I approached the Carter homestead. As I crested a hill in front of it, something jumped out of an old log cabin and ran in the opposite direction. I was still close to a mile away, so I had to use my binoculars to get a better look. What I saw through the lenses chilled me to the bone. It was a wolf, but it was massive and solid black. It was so large that it could be mistaken for a black bear, but it was undeniably canine. After seeing the wolf, my gut told me to turn around and come back later with company, but I ultimately continued. Throughout the course of the afternoon, I managed to convince myself that the wolf I saw was nothing more than a coyote, and that its black fur was just a shadow. It was nearing dusk before I arrived back to the mint place, herding thirty head of cattle in front of me. After I penned the cattle up, I led Ace back to my pickup and my horse trailer. From a distance, I could see there was something wrong with the trailer, and as I approached, I found that the axle had come apart. It didn't make any sense to me, as it was fine when I drove in, and there was no explanation as to what could have made it come apart when it wasn't even moving. By this time, it was fairly dark outside, and as we were coming out the next day, I decided to unhook the trailer and leave Ace in the corral overnight. When I left, I saw three blue lights near the corrals, but I attributed these lights to hunters, so I continued driving. I also heard some more of these howls I had heard earlier in the day. When all three of us arrive the next morning, we find the corrals a total mess. All the grass was turned up inside the corrals where the cattle had been milling, and the fence was broken in several places. The cattle that were penned up in the night before were nowhere to be found, along with Ace. My brother and nephew took off on horseback to try to locate some of the cattle and ace, but only managed to find about twenty head. As I was about without a horse, we repaired the trailer and left later in the afternoon. The next day all three of us rode, and we searched exclusively for ace. During this time I covered a lot of country that I would have otherwise missed, and I discovered more bizarre things. At the bottom of one canyon were hundreds of holes about one foot in diameter and three feet deep. These holes had been dug by people, as if there would be no animal that would have dug them. I also found a bone pile, which was exceptionally strange. There were carcasses of four cows all piled on top of each other, in an area that they typically wouldn't have been accessing. At first I thought that this was maybe the act of poachers who were illegally killing and butchering cattle at the ranch. There would have been no way to get to this location with a pickup or a four-wheeler for that matter. The more we searched, the less sense everything even made. We searched for three days before we came across something. My brother radioed me, and there was no cell service, and he believed he had found Ace. My nephew and I rode to his location, and sure enough, at the bottom of a sinkhole, and sinkholes are very common in this area, was the carcass of Ace along with three cows. The sinkhole was at the bottom of a canyon, with the walls of this canyon being 300 feet tall, the sinkhole being another 20 feet deep. It took an hour just to climb down the canyon wall when I finally approached the sinkhole. I found Ace to be heavily mutilated. Both ears were removed, along with the eyes and nostrils and hooves. The back of him was not exposed, but it looked like his tail had also been removed. The cows surrounding him had similar mutilations. As was the case with the howls, the wolf and the trailer, none of this made sense. It would have been almost impossible for just one cow to end up in this location, let alone three cows and a horse. There were also no tracks leading into it or out of the sinkhole in the canyon. The sheriff and the veterinarian were both notified and an investigation was launched. The ultimate conclusion was that something had caused the cattle to spook and break out of the corrals, and whatever was spooking them 
ran all the way to the mint place to the bottom of the sinkhole in which they perished. When I mentioned the wolf I had seen, they were dismissive, just as I had been when the hunters told me of the wolf three years prior. No foul play was suspected and the case was closed. Though there were many strange things that have happened since then, there were none quite as upsetting as the loss of my horse. Cattle continue to go missing, and we now only ride the place in pairs. My brother and I are thinking about terminating the lease, as for the moment, the current cattle losses are unsustainable. I've always been a big YouTube watcher, and I found that many stories on the site came from Reddit, so I decided to share mine. Though I don't have any pictures of Ace in the sinkhole, my phone was destroyed in an unrelated incident that I didn't have my files backed up. I do have pictures of a separate bone pile and some of the ranch. Cemetery Experience Traveling back in time to Yugoslavia in the 1980s, more specifically in Macedonia, I have an eerie story to tell you. It all started with my dad's friend, who was a teenager at the time, and was part of a group of friends that used to hang out together. The story takes place in a cemetery, as they used to go there often, being in a rural area surrounded by mountains and forests. One dark night, while they were walking along the cemetery, they noticed some strange figures in the distance. Being the daring teens that they were, they started walking towards them, and as they got closer, they could see that these people looked human, but their clothes were outdated, as if from another time period. Not being intimidated, my dad's friend yelled, hey, to get their attention, but they just kept on walking, not paying them any mind. Feeling provoked, the group of friends continued walking towards the strange group, yelling and trying to get their attention. The strange group continued to walk slowly and deliberately and even started laughing at their group of friends, as if they were playing with them. This made the group of friends angry, and they wanted to confront them and possibly mug them. What village are you from, yelled my dad's friend, but still no response. The group started picking up the pace, then running and eventually sprinting. They just couldn't catch up to the strange figures, even though they were walking slowly. It was then that they realized that these people were not human. Fear set in and they ran for their lives, eventually escaping to the cemetery. It was only after that that they left the cemetery, that they realized that the strange figures had disappeared, as if they were never there to begin with. For years, my dad's friend and his group of friends tried to make sense of what had happened that fateful night. They couldn't find any explanation for the strange figures they encountered in the cemetery. It was as if they had stepped into a different dimension, one where time was irrelevant and things were not what they seemed. The story is a reminder that there's still many mysteries in this world that we've yet to uncover, Perhaps there are things out there that we can't comprehend, and things that we should leave alone and not provoke. This tale is a chilling reminder that there are some things that should remain a mystery. Ghost at my mom's house. When I was growing up, odd things would happen in my childhood home. It wasn't until I was an adult that I realized there was a ghost in my bedroom. This man would stand at the end of my bed and follow me around the house, sometimes scratching and hitting me in the night. It was a terrifying experience, one that I wouldn't wish on anyone. Even now, my partner and children refuse to sleep in that room without me, even though I've told them the stories because it feels weird. My mom, on the other hand, is a diehard skeptic when it comes to ghosts. She doesn't want to believe that there's something in her house. But this morning, she came downstairs to find all the photos on one wall had come off. They were on hooks and they were all hanging, and still on the wall, and not bent. Which means that the photos must have been lifted up off the hooks and flown across the room. Some of them fell straight down while others ended up six feet away. This event made my mom finally see that there's something in this house. She freaked out, understandably so. We've never had this kind of activity in the house before, and it's unsettling to think that there might be something lurking in the shadows. Despite her skepticism, my mom's now open to the idea that there might be a ghost in the house. Who knows what other strange things might happen in the days or weeks to come. <laughs> 
experience last night. Let me tell you a story about the strange and unsettling experience that happened to me last night. It's a story that'll chill you to the bone and leave you questioning everything you thought and knew about the world we live in. It all started when I was laying in my bed trying to drift off into sleep. As I closed my eyes and relaxed my body, I suddenly became aware of the presence in the room with me. I knew instantly that it was a ghostly figure that had been haunting my room for some time now. At first, I tried to ignore it and focus on falling asleep, but then something strange happened. As I was getting closer and drifting off, I heard a whisper in my head. It was like someone was speaking directly into my mind. I was confused and frightened, as I knew I was home alone and there was no one else in the room with me. I opened my eyes and looked around, but there was no one there. The room was dark and silent, and the only sound I could hear was the beating of my own heart. Suddenly, I felt a rush of cold air, as if freezing wind had blown through the room. It was so cold that it took my breath away, and I gasped for air. But as I was gasping, I felt something strange happening to my body. It was like the cold was seeping into me, spreading through my veins and chilling me to the bone. Then the sensation became even more intense as I felt something cold pass through me and at the back of my head. It was like I was being invaded by something, and I could feel his presence all around me. I was terrified and I didn't know what to do. For a moment, I lay there frozen, unable to move or even breathe, but then I knew I had to do something. I got up from my bed and stumbled towards the door, my body shaking with fear. As I reached for the handle, I felt a sudden burst of energy and flung the door open. I ran down the hallway and into the living room where I collapsed on the sofa, gasping for air. I was shaking all over and my heart was pounding so hard that I thought it would burst out of my chest. I knew that something terrible had just happened to me, and I didn't know if I'd ever be able to sleep again. To this day, I still don't know what caused that strange and terrifying feeling. Was it really a ghost that haunted my room? Or was it something else entirely? All I know is that I'll never forget that particular night, and I'll always be haunted by the memory of the cold, dark presence that invaded my body and my mind. We used to live in a haunted house. In the depths of my memory, I can recall a time when my family lived in a three-floor building. Our family was large, and we all had our fair share of experiences within the walls of that house. I'll start with my own experience, which was brief but unnerving. Often I would hear loud footsteps coming from the third floor, as if someone was running or stomping with all their might. But when I investigated, there was never anyone up there. Additionally, I would hear the sound of a large wood block being dragged across the floor and knocks on the window. And in the bathroom, the lights would mysteriously turn off and then back on again. My brother, who slept in the guest house separate from the main building, once woke up at 2 or 3 a.m. to see a baby crawling toward him. He was so frightened that he jumped out of bed and didn't return until sunrise. Another brother of mine went to watch a movie in the same guest house. After he finished and unplugged the TV, he left the room, but moments later he heard the sound of the TV still playing, despite it being unplugged. My sister claims to have seen the wood block being dragged by an unseen force. Although I had only heard it being moved before, she saw it. And my mother, during her prayer sessions, would often feel someone standing behind her, whispering into her ear. In addition to all these experiences, we would occasionally see a black cat roaming around the house, even though we had reportedly kicked her outside. Overall, the house seemed to be filled with a multitude of unexplainable occurrences, each one leaving us feeling uneasy and unsure of what to do next. Though we eventually moved out of the house, the memories of those strange events continue to haunt us to this day. What are the odds? Approximately two years prior to purchasing my current house, a tragic event occurred in what is now my room, a murder-suicide. As a result, one might wonder if paranormal activity should be expected. 
Despite residing here for the past eight years, little has occurred, save for the occasional sound of pots and pans being thrown into the kitchen floor. While I'm curious about the possibility of paranormal activity, I'm uncertain of the best course of action to explore this curiosity. One might argue that the odds of experiencing paranormal activity are heightened given the history of the house. After all, a tragic event occurred within these walls, leaving behind residual energy that could manifest in supernatural ways. However, I have found that the sounds of pots and pans being thrown onto the kitchen floor are easily explained away by natural causes, such as settling of the house or the occasional rodent. Despite my skepticism, I can't help but be curious about the possibility of paranormal activity in my home. There are various methods that one might employ to explore this possibility, such as conducting a paranormal investigation or hiring a professional to conduct an energy cleansing of the house. However, I'm hesitant to engage in these activities as I'm unsure of the potential consequences and I don't want to invite negative energy into my home. Ultimately, the decision to explore the possibility of paranormal activity in my home rests with me. While the history of the house may suggest that such activity is possible, my personal experiences have been relatively uneventful. Therefore, I must weigh the potential risks and benefits before deciding whether or not to engage in further investigation. Experiences as a church chaplain and demonologist. I've been asked many times now in responses and conversations in this sub and others to share my experiences as an order of the St. John chaplain and demonologist. It's hard to know where to start, to be honest. But the most important thing, I think, is to say that these are my beliefs and my experiences. I certainly don't begrudge you and yours, and definitely don't want to assert any kind of authority over the beliefs of others. As chaplains, we're not positioned within a church because we minister to communities. It isn't our place to judge any member of that community but only to care for and support them in their needs. As rule number one of the job is to disprove, disprove, and disprove again. Other than that, to save you the trouble, I'll write things in order of how much interest I think they'd get, experiences some insights into our processes, which I'm allowed to speak of, how I got into the field, and then the training I undertook. Experiences. General and passive paranormal experiences are part of the parcel of the job. I'll touch on it more later, but I'm not afraid of things that go bump in the night. I used to be, but once you've studied and understood it, the paranormal loses its excitement and becomes more of a puzzle that needs to be solved. My passive experiences are things like every month or so, so I'll have a new knocking on our doors and windows, even though we live in a secure third floor apartment. I get random prods and pokes when I'm by myself, whispering, murmuring, growling, and scratching, electrical interference, random mists, distorted shadows, and shadow figures here and there. This has all become weekly occurrences, although when I say that, it's usually just one of these things that happens. I deal with it, then it goes away almost immediately. The Hitchhiker This is probably my most fascinating one because it's a reoccurring event that happens every couple of months, and I haven't yet solved the puzzle. I travel a lot for my role, and at the moment, I've been sent to one of our small towns to train people, run mental health programs, or help with large-scale crisis responses. This results in my driving for long hours, sometimes during the day and sometimes at night. I'll see the same stocky, hitchhiking figure walking along the side of the road in a black hoodie and jeans with the hood up, thumb out, I've never stopped, and he's never turned around when I've approached. I've seen him at every point in the day, dawn, day, dusk, night. I've seen him in locations several hour drives from each location. At first I thought it was a coincidence, but hitchhiking is really uncommon in our country. We're small and buses are cheap. Howling. This is another recurring one, although it's newer. It's more annoying than anything else, to be honest but several times my partner and I have been woken up to a long howl in our bedroom. We're windows closed, apartment unit like I said, but it's ruining my sleep and I really enjoy my sleep. Cloaked figure. 
This is one that I've thankfully resolved, but had to deal with over a series of years. To cut a long story short, whenever I was in the middle of a really tough case supporting someone in what we call spiritual warfare, I'd get a visit from whatever this was. It was the same every time, where I would have a dream of a cloaked figure, wake up to a spinning room and be choking. I've had sleep paralysis episodes before, but this was certainly different. I'm still half convinced this was some kind of sleep apnea, maybe. An issue or an episode. The only thing that makes me think it was paranormal is because it happened without fail, when I dreamt of this figure, and it stopped after I put some intentional work into stopping it. There are experiences of clients that I can't share because I've made a strictly confidential agreement with them, and that'll rest on my soul, but generally speaking, I've helped people deal with their psychological issues more than spiritual. Some spiritual ones have been fascinating, though, and there's a feeling I get when there's a really obvious sign of oppression or infestation. It's like a heavy feeling on my chest and stuffy air. I've helped people by blessing their houses, which is a complicated process, and depending on your beliefs, it can be somewhat risky. You essentially have to call forth the oppressing force, challenge it, rebuke it, and either condemn it or suppress it if it can't be dealt with in one blessing. I've also helped people with deliverance, although I'm not big on the evangelical deliverance ministry. We're a more traditional denomination. But I've never helped with an exorcism. I'm still relatively young for my role, and while I'm commissioned member of the order, I'm not yet fully ordained as minister. We have to be careful with what we share, and that's for a really insane reason. We often get people who either want to play a prank or desperately want something paranormal to happen, and the information we don't share is essentially the key information we need while triaging our cases. What I can say is how we view the paranormal, and it's unusual. Anything paranormal by our ideology is demonological, angelic, or the Holy Spirit. When it comes to things that we humans get scared of, we're hardwired to be scared of the paranormal if we believe in it. It's a non-interactable nocturnal threat. And we're a diurnal creature. It's really easy to trigger our limbic system. However, and again, just my view, I see paranormal activity as parlor tricks of the damned and jealous entities. But I have the power to send them back where they belong. And they know that. So it's always a struggle, however it can. It will try and scare me, because it's scared of me. And it should be. I'm there to do a job. It's like spiritual pest extermination. But a moving cup, whispering or growling, etc., etc., is nowhere as scary to me as, say, driving in heavy rain or things I deal with as a bouncer while I studied. Humans, dogs, even cats are more dangerous than most hauntings or paranormal experiences. One exception is that possession is incredibly dangerous, but intensely rare. I'm not scared of these things, not because I'm tough or brave, but because they're not actually dangerous, and they need to be condemned. That being said, if we go through an intensive investigatory process, it looks like this. We're a medical order. We're the Knights Hospitalier. We're also an indigenous-focused arm of the Order, and our indignity gives us a different world view. When we assess a person, we don't just look at their spiritual health. We look at their social, physical, and psychological health as well. The first thing we do, fully funded, is have the person see a doctor and psychologist for assessment. This isn't because we think they're crazy, it's because we're building a comprehensive profile for exactly what we're dealing with. If someone is positive for physical or mental health issues that could be causing problems that they believe are spiritual, we need to treat those and see if the symptoms go away. Our church fully covers any costs associated with this process. If that doesn't solve the problems, my job is to definitively disprove the existence of paranormal activity or presences but to do so while believing there may well be a presence. Skepticism is a good thing most of the time, but it's sometimes bad. We're not there to assume the issue is mundane. 
We take all the information we can, assess it, and arrive at the likely outcomes. And we consider spiritual outcomes to be similarly as likely as mundane ones. However, we still need to disprove all of the mundane theories we can. But there's another layer. We also need to prove all of the mundane theories. This helps us have the quality of information, so we won't be happy to say, oh, it's probably just this mundane thing, unless we can prove that. After this, if there is a persistence of a spiritual issue, we begin our church-sanctified processes of blessing and protections for the affected individual. These interventions vary on intensity depending on the person, their faith relationship, and the persistence of whatever we're dealing with. How I got into the field. I didn't take a standard pathway. A standard pathway is that you attend a church that believes in demonological study. Get as involved as possible with whatever you can, talk to the pastor about your desire to study and follow this pathway, and see if the church will support you. It's a long pathway, though. You can also try to become a lay chaplain for certain denominations, but honestly, the best thing you can do is wholeheartedly commit to a church. Show them that you're willing, and they'll support your journey. My pathway was that I studied a youth psych degree and specialized in youth gangs. Then a church was investigating into the community and looking for a Christian with my expertise to be their youth pastor. I worked there for some time, and after a bit of a journey, came back to my home denomination, and that's who I work for now. I got a master's in professional practice complacency and a diploma in demonology, but my psychology knowledge is what sets me apart for this ministry in the eyes of the church. I'm much more equipped to do referral assessment than many of the clergy or congregation. My training. My training in demonology comes from several sources. I completed the diploma at Bible College, but I've also done a small amount of training under a course from the bishop, James Long. I did the Paranormal Academy of the United Kingdom online course because it's a non-Christian and I trained under our archbishop for some time to specifically respond to the needs of the community in this particular regard. As a chaplain, this calling fit under my purview in his eyes. When I need to escalate church involvement, I can go straight to him. He taught me our beliefs, blessings, the processes of our church, things like that. He also taught me that our church's stance on demonology, which is pretty old school. We're Anglican. King James was a demonologist, so it's a particular field for us. That's pretty much it. I'm always open for helping people on here, so if you have trouble, please just reach out through a message. I'm also happy to answer questions and engage in discourse, although I'm not going to need to maybe entirely engage in what-ifs from the stories. But for me, it's almost impossible to prove the paranormal online due to the nature of the evidence and how easy it can be to be faked. So, I'm not going to go into that. And I've peer-reviewed these things with my colleagues. A house in northern Maine. This telling is about something odd that happened many years after I lived in the house. I'll omit the bulk of the background. I lived in a 1900 farmhouse in northern Maine in Aristook County, along the border of Canada. The house was a small two-story, clapboard-sided farmhouse. The central heat was a giant handcrafted metal stove. It was large enough to fit a log a foot in diameter and three feet long, and sat in the middle of the dirt-floored basement. The stove was so airtight that you could throw in several chunks of split hardwood and dog it down tight. Then you crack the air vent just a tiny bit, and the fire would smolder all night, with heat drifting up through the vents and ducts. It was the main heat in the house, although there were two additional cast iron wood stoves. I lived there with my father and his girlfriend. My father would spend a lot of time working on the property, clearing brush. He also worked on scraping and peeling paint and applying new fresh coats. Although he refused to invest money in the house, so many of his repairs were low quality and incomplete. After I moved away, I stayed away for over 15 years. One day, my wife and I were staying at a hotel a few hours away, and we found ourselves with a free day to randomly explore. 
We ended up driving back to the area of that house and decided to make it our destination. The area hadn't changed much. The area is very sparse with lots of dense trees and large grassy yards and fields, farms here and there. We turned off the U.S. Highway 1 onto the road named Wilcox Settlement Road. The house was maybe a quarter mile down. The sun was low in the late afternoon sky, a bit above the trees. I pulled up at the end of the driveway, or dooryard as the locals call it, and stopped in in the road. The house was a wreck and in much worse shape than when my father had owned it. There were a few beat up cars parked by the house. There were barrels and scrap wood and random old junk all around the yard and the porch. Much of the siding had also been removed, exposing mylar-backed foam insulation boards that had been pressed between the studs and the exterior walls. There was an old, dented, rusty pickup truck, parked closest to the road, where it sat idling. My foot on the brake, my wife and I sat gaping at the creepy old dilapidated house. The yard was overgrown and the brush had reclaimed most of what my father had laboriously cleared all those years ago. Movement caught my eye in the dimming light. A waving hand. There was a man standing on the other side of the old pickup truck, and he was slowly waving his arm, beckoning us toward him. He was a large, overweight man, late 30s to mid 40s, dressed in a dirty work coat. His mouth was open in a gap toothed smile, and he just stood there still except for his upraised right arm, slowly beckoning us to pull into the driveway. I was frightened. First of all, we didn't see him initially, so it caught us off guard to have him standing as close as he was. Secondly, the way he stood there watching us beckoning reminded me of a scene from a backwoods horror film. The man's smile seemed to be cunning and a veneer of harmlessness, bellied by a bleary cold glint of greed or worse. I instinctively floored the accelerator and sped away. I hate that house. It was a very bad place. I felt like it was stained with bleak sadness, fear, and loneliness. Haunted House in Ventura There's a house in downtown Ventura that's reportedly very haunted. It's a huge old house. My sister met a woman who used to live there. It has seven bedrooms spread over four levels. I'm not quite sure what the architect called the type of it, so I'll just describe it as an old wood frame house with an antique ornate style. Picturesque, set on the foothill, overlooking downtown, and the ocean, and the Channel Islands. When I lived in the area, the house was vacant, During my frequent late night walks, I'd sometimes sneak up the two dozen front stairs and peer in the window, or walk around back. Occasionally, I'd bring a date up there to fool around on the porch swing. It was vacant for a long time. My sister told me the house was haunted, and once when she was visiting the house, a floor lamp suddenly slid across the living room, apparently of its own volition. Startled, she looked at her friend woman who lived there, and she kind of shrugged and said that things like that occurred frequently. They would often hear noises from the upper floor. There was another tenant who resided up there, and sometimes they would also hear noises, like someone talking or walking around, only to find out later that the tenant was not even at home. She eventually moved out, and sometime later I met her, and I asked her about the house. She confirmed the lamp story said that many things happened up there, and that she moved out because of that. She hated living there. She said, let me show you something. She pulled out her phone and flipped to a photograph of a young man sitting on a sofa in front of a dark picture window, or maybe glass sliding doors. She said that was her son on the couch. The photo was just kind of a typical random snapshot of a kid sitting on a couch. Also in the photo was a large swirl of white smoke to the right of the kid. It looked like cigarette smoke that had drifted in front of the lens. Except when I looked closer, I was startled and frightened by what I noticed about it. There was a very clearly defined face in the smoke, 
not a human face, but one of a creature with elongated muzzle and a head shaped like a canine. The mouth was open, showing large, sharp, pointy teeth. The eyes were fierce and appeared to be looking into the camera. I truly hate to say it, but I tend to roll my eyes at stories like this, but it's best described as a dragon or demon face. I don't believe in demons. The image was unmistakable and gave me chills and goosebumps. The woman said that she hadn't seen anything when she took the photo, that it was just a casual snapshot of her son while they were sitting and watching television. She managed to get the landlord and reluctantly let her out of the lease after she told him everything that happened there. Eventually, they found tenants. There were old cars and beat-up motorcycles out front and junk stored on the porches and balconies, so they didn't appear to be neat, clean, orderly tenants, and the house looked in need of repairs and maintenance. I never met the new residents, but I wonder if they had any experiences in that creepy old house. Ghost That Mimics Footsteps of Family Members I've been looking online for someone with a similar experience, but I keep finding forms of people describing a spirit that mimics their loved one's voices. When I was 16, my family moved to a house in Indiana, and we only lived there for about a year before moving back to my hometown, but during that year, it was really hard. There was a lot of negative energy in the home because my mom had a mental illness, and there was just a lot of fighting and crying going on. I bring this up because I also see people describing spirits who maybe feed off of negativity. And that was just a really hard year, so maybe that helps identify the ghost. Anyway, it's not out of the ordinary for my dad to get a glass of water or juice at like 2am out of nowhere. And during this time, me and my sister were sleeping on the couch. Together a lot. Because we were just fall asleep whatever was on Netflix would just keep going. And one night, I hear my dad's footsteps clearly. And I know that they're my dad's because he has a heavy footstep. I even heard the fridge open, clear as day. But I just thought it was my dad, so I yelled over, Can you get me a nice tea? And there was no response. So I look over from the back of the couch. The kitchen was behind the couch. And it was just a dark-ass kitchen. No footsteps were heard of him going back to his room, so I was confused. When I ran to his bedroom to see him snoring, I was really scared, but I didn't want to acknowledge what had just happened. So I watched Netflix until I could go to sleep that night. Okay, so fast forward a few months later. My sister's room is in the basement in this house. An unfinished basement, too, so kind of creepy to stay in that room yourself. So I slept there a lot, too, and I would chill in the room with her. One day we're smoking in her bedroom, the door is open. Broad daylight, might I add. And we hear the sound of someone barefoot. Barefoot? Running back and forth in front of the door. On the cement floors of the basement, like clear as day, we could hear the padding of feet just slapping against the cement. I couldn't believe my sister was witnessing this with me, but we were so scared we just closed the door. Nothing has happened since then, while we stayed there. So what was that? It didn't mimic voices, but it did mimic my dad's footsteps that night. Not sure about the basement footsteps, it sounded lighter, the running. So could it be my mom or my sister? But has anyone ever experienced something similar? Is this a mimic spirit? Paranormal Encounter with Lift As a 17-year-old, I've lived in the same apartment building my entire life, but my family and I are finally moving out soon to a bigger flat. The building itself is not much older than me, but the elevator has always been kind of wonky and prone to breaking down. At times, it would activate on its own and go to a random floor, or doors would get stuck for no good reason, and 10 seconds before finally closing, causing frustration for those inside. However, for the past year or two, I can't remember the exact duration, something strange has been happening with the elevator. It's been opening its doors on the ground floor every time I enter the building, as if it's waiting for me. 
At first, I thought it was a coincidence because, as I mentioned, the elevator is constantly malfunctioning. But it kept happening. Every single time. Like it was timing my entry to the building and opening its doors exactly when I took the first two steps toward it. It never missed the mark. It always opened on the exact step I took. The strange thing is that it only happens when I'm alone and returning to the building. It doesn't happen when I'm with someone else or leaving the building. It's like the elevator is waiting for me specifically. The odd behavior doesn't stop there either. It seems to get angry when I try to avoid it. By taking the stairs instead, the elevator doors would aggressively shut as if it was trying to force me to take it. I've tried to test it, if it's just a coincidence, by opening the building's entrance door and waiting to see if the elevator would close on its own, but it never does. It always waits for me. At first I was creeped out and paranoid about the strange behavior, but now I've become so accustomed to it that it doesn't even faze me anymore. However, I can't help but worry that the strange elevator behavior will continue in a new building since it also has an elevator. I don't believe in ghosts or supernatural phenomena, but this strange occurrence is still unsettling. I've tried to confide in my friends about it, but they don't take me seriously. I'm afraid to tell my parents because I don't want them to think I'm crazy or brush it off as nothing. This elevator has become a strange and unsettling part of my daily routine, and I wanted to share my story because it's been bothering me for quite some time now. What does it mean when a ghost hides things on you? I've lived in this house 20 years, and over the years, things have gotten missing and then showed back right in front of our faces. One time, my mom, for the life of her, couldn't find her bracelet. She takes it off every night and leaves it on her nightstand. She searched and searched for days with no avail. A few mornings later, the bracelet showed up right in front of the coffee pot. My mom is an avid coffee drinker at least two every morning and even at night. There's no way she missed it. Another time my asthma inhaler went missing. I used it the night before and put it on my sock drawer right next to my bed. And this top drawer is reachable and holds snacks and other things I may want in the night. I got up the next morning and went to work. At this time in my life, I was dealing with severe asthma that I never had an ounce in the past. I called my mom from work. She's always been a stay-at-home mom and asked her if she could bring my inhaler to work for me because I forgot and I couldn't breathe. Mind you, I had just filled the prescription the day before. She looks where I tell her to look. She calls back, says it's not there. I tell her, yes it is. I just used it before bed. She looks again and searches the house. Nothing. Mind you, my mother finds everything. She always sees things I can't find. She calls me back again saying it's nowhere and that I must have it. I look again. I don't have it. I call the pharmacy. Now I happen to know the girl who works there. She went to school with my sister and she recognizes my voice. She tells me since I pick up, I'll ring it through the register next week and have you pay for it then, once insurance will cover it again. My mother picks it up and brings it to me at work. At this particular time, my grandmother was visiting from Florida and she had dinner over at my house with my parents. I stroll in from work at about 9 p.m. I walk into the kitchen where my mom had just cleared away all the dishes from dinner. I go to pull out a chair at the table, and I go, Seriously, Mom? My inhaler was in the middle of the kitchen table. My mother, in shock, just says, What? I go, It's right here. She says to me, Melissa, I just ate dinner at this table, cleared it and set the table before we ate, and cleared and wiped it after we ate. It was not there. It's still a mystery why this stuff happened. Is that just a spirit getting a kick out of blowing our minds? Can someone tell me what this means or is? During my childhood, specifically when I was around 8 or 9, I used to wake up early in the morning and watch television. However, on one particular night, something strange happened that I couldn't explain. As I was descending down the stairs, I heard a faint giggle from the living room, and I immediately assumed that it was my younger sister playing a prank on me. 
Despite the darkness that surrounded me, I continued to walk down the stairs, expecting to see my sibling's playful face. To my surprise, there was no one in the room, and neither the television nor the lights were on. It was a strange feeling of fear mixed with curiosity that engulfed me as I tried to investigate what was going on. Suddenly, a little girl who I believed to be a ghost ran past me, holding a stuffed animal in one hand and an unidentifiable object in the other. The girl's laughter echoed through the house as she darted from the living room into the kitchen, and within a few seconds, she had disappeared entirely. The little girl had curly hair and was dressed in an old-fashioned attire that I'd never seen before. It was an unsettling experience, and for a while I kept it to myself, wondering if anyone else had ever witnessed anything similar in the house. However, I later found out that nobody had ever died in that house or the neighboring houses, and it was built by my great-grandparents. Despite my investigations, I couldn't find any rational explanation for what I saw that night. It remains a mystery to this day, and I often wonder if it was a ghost or just my imagination playing tricks on me. My ghost is a real pain in the ass, and I need him to leave my house. Approximately three days ago, I started noticing a series of footsteps and vibrations that seemed to originate from someone walking around my house. However, as time progressed, this entity has become a constant annoyance, pestering me to no end. Despite my age of 71 and my status as a non-veteran living alone, I never believed in the existence of ghosts and the like. However, the situation has caused me to reassess my beliefs, as this thing has become as real as the rain is to me. Despite being invisible to me, this entity has been causing me endless aggravation. He now spends the majority of his time in my house, and I'm unable to make him leave. He vibrates my bed so much that it shakes me awake, forcing me to sleep on the couch instead. He's even gone so far as to become more daring continuously walking around and vibrating the floors, forcing me to tell him to sit down and be quiet. His arrival has become so obvious that I can pinpoint his exact presence by the noises and sounds that he makes. Initially, I was unafraid of him, but he started to creep me out on a few occasions. I've tried being cordial to him, but it doesn't seem to work. Now I curse him like hell because I no longer care about being polite. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to have any effect either. I need this entity to leave me alone and vacate my home once and for all. The situation has escalated to the point that is the craziest thing I've ever witnessed. At first it was fascinating, but now it's made me mad as hell, and I'm powerless to stop him from coming and going as he pleases, and I can't do anything to make him listen to me. As I write this, he's present, and I can't stand the sight of him. I've exhausted all of my options and I have nothing else to try. Therefore, I'm willing to pay somebody who can assist me in getting rid of this entity. He must leave, no matter how it's accomplished. I was happy before he arrived, and I won't be content again until he's gone. Antique Mirror one day, my husband and I decided to visit his mother at her friend's house in the countryside, which wasn't too far from our own residence. The house was quite old and had a distinct 1930s feel to it, though it could have even been older than that. The house was filled with antiques and it had an eerie feel to it. Apparently, the previous owner of the house, who had lived there for many, many years, passed away upstairs. I couldn't remember the exact cause of death, but I think it was old age. As we were exploring the living room, my eyes were drawn to a massive antique mirror that had dominated one wall. Being a bit vain, I couldn't resist taking a look at myself in it. However, just as I was admiring my reflection, I felt something poke behind my neck. It was like a bony finger slowly prodding the back of my skull. I was completely freaked out by this sudden and unexpected sensation. Immediately, I turned around and asked my husband and mother-in-law if they had touched me but they both denied it. I was sure that they hadn't, as I would have seen their reflection in the mirror. 
It was as if something or someone was trying to taunt me for looking into it. I wondered if it was the spirit of the previous owner, or even the mirror itself, that was responsible for the eerie sensation. From that moment on, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was watching me in the house. It was almost as if the antique objects in the house had a life of their own and they were communicating with me in their own way. I couldn't help but wonder if the house was haunted or if the previous owner's spirit was still lingering. The experience has left a lasting impression on me, and I found myself unable to forget about it for weeks afterward. It made me wonder about the power of objects and how they can retain the energy of people who once owned them. It also made me more mindful of the potential for supernatural phenomena in our daily lives and how we should always be open to the unexpected. So I bought a doll today with an attachment and just wanted to share what happened already. Let me tell you a story about an incredible experience that I had recently. It all started when I acquired a new addition to my collection, a doll with an unusual history. Upon getting her into my car, I immediately tested her with an EMF reader and a spirit box. The EMF was going crazy and the spirit box gave a clear message, don't. I stopped and apologized to the spirit hoping to make it feel more comfortable. During the drive home, I spoke to the spirit of the doll, assuring it that it was in good hands now, and that it would be well taken care of. I treated it as if I were talking to a friend, hoping to ease any fears or doubts it might have. Once we arrived home, I placed the doll on top of my entertainment center, high up where it would be safe. I left it there for a while to get used to its new surroundings. When I returned to check on it, decided to do another test with the EMF and spirit box. This time, the spirit box instructed me to hold it higher. And when I did, it asked, what do you want me to do? The spirit was causing the EMF to bottom out instead of spike, which was unusual. So I asked it to make the meter go the other way, and it did. Then the spirit bot asked me, am I dead? I responded with a yes and asked for its name. It replied soon. And then everything stopped. It was almost as if the spirit was in shock, realizing that it was dead and needed time to process it. I was amazed by this experience and wanted to share it with you all. It just goes to show that sometimes the unexpected can happen, and we should always be open to new experiences. Who knows what other incredible things might be out there waiting for us to discover. Alrighty, I'll give it a try, but you'll be missing out on some crucial aspects. Counselors in the woods and shaking trees, the four week long build up, having ten other kids gathered around the campfire with you, etc, etc, but I'll do my damnedest. Once in a long time past, a story was told, a story that was meant to keep children from straying out by night, a traditional story about a man with a very long arm and very long legs and with no face. All dressed up, as if snatching a child was a special occasion. They said if he saw the man, you had to run right home or he would get you. Or you would never be seen again. Cue tree shaking and shit. Now this was just a scary story to tell children, but as some kids found out, in every horror story, there is a grain of truth. Sometimes someone's little boy or girl would be out too late, and they just wouldn't come home. Maybe they just fell in a river or were washed away, or maybe someone snatched them up, and they were just gone forever, but whatever the cause, those children had just vanished. Now, as stories are wont to do, they followed their storyteller wherever they went, be it to the next town over to scare the children there about how little Jimmy had disappeared, or to a whole continent, as the story did when colonists started to go there in what we now call America. The new colonists realized very quickly that their new land was nothing like their ancestral home. It was much more dangerous, and all of a sudden, the need to have their kids home at night grew greatly. They kept the same story as all the kids knew it already, but they started to change some things. All of a sudden, you couldn't run home and tell your parents, there was a man out there, he was so scary. I'm sorry for being out late, protect me, but instead, if you saw the scary man, you just weren't seen again. 
As I said earlier, sometimes kids never came home, but all of a sudden, children weren't coming home more and more frequently. Oftentimes, a child that stayed out after dark would come home stricken and terrified, telling stories about how a tall man with no face followed them all the way home, only to take them days or weeks later. Q screaming in the dark woods behind me. Eventually, the village men realized this was getting out of hand, gathered up their assortment of old-timely weapons and started a search in the woods. Unfortunately for the children of the town, but fortunately for their musket-bearing fathers, no such man was found. The men went home, laughed manly laughs, patted their children on the heads, and went about their business. Well, that is until the disappearances started again. This time the men would bring children, who had seen the slender man, as he had been dubbed, and all of a sudden, there started to be sightings. Children would point out a tree that wasn't a tree, but a tall man that no one had seen before. These searches started to yield casualties as the spirit that followed them to America started taking even the adults who saw him. People started to slowly figure out that if you saw him, then others around would see him as well. And after a sighting, people who saw the Slender Man would take their own lives rather than be taken and risk loved ones seeing him as well. The victims of Slender Man were doomed then, and they're still doomed today. For Slender Man is your fear. He is an old and vengeful fay from the old homeland of humanity. The stories told fed him the fear and made him grow stronger until he grew greater and greater so that he no longer needed the stories. All it took was for someone to be out alone in the woods, and they would feel it, their fear, feeding him. Once they had reached your peak of horror, he would take you and would never let you be seen again. Oftentimes, someone cannot see him once and reach this peak, however, so he follows you wherever you go. He is your own personal horror that no one else can see, unless, of course, you show someone else in which case they're just as doomed as you. And don't go thinking that you're safe if you show someone else, because here's the kicker. He isn't just one place. He is everywhere. Just by dooming your friend, you weren't escaping. You were just feeding him, making him stronger. So children, the moral of the story is this. Never travel by yourself. He likes loners. Never travel by night. That's his time. Now most importantly, don't ever look at the trees. That's his place. My only experience with the paranormal, and it's been stuck in my head every day for over a decade. This happened in the summer of 2009 during the storyteller's junior year of high school. It's a vivid recollection that's seared into their memory. They weren't under the influence of any substances, nor were they sleep deprived. In fact, they were both on their way home from a summer job at a fast food joint. They rode in an open jeep with the top off and the doors removed to fully embrace the summer weather. As they turned onto the road that was a frequent shortcut home, the storyteller was playing Tetris on their flip phone. They were chatting with their best friend John about their shift that night when suddenly John slammed on the brakes so hard that the storyteller's phone and food flew off their lap. The storyteller looked at their left to ask what the problem was when they saw John staring ahead, eyes bulging and face drained of color. As the storyteller looked ahead, they saw what could only be described as a hunched over hooded figure with a small pointed head about seven feet in front of them crossing the road. It appeared to be using a walking stick and had a limp. The way it moved wasn't natural, and it seemed to glide rather than walk. It turned its head to look at them as it crossed the road, but they couldn't discern any facial features. The storyteller and John were both transfixed and watched as it crest over the hill towards the children's cemetery. The storyteller had the impression that it was female, but they couldn't explain why. The storyteller and John have discussed this frequently, but they've not found anything online that describes what they saw. Most of the ghost stories they've come across are one-person accounts and lack detail. 
Therefore, they welcome any feedback or comment that anyone may have, whether it's a question or a private message, any input that would be immensely appreciated. This event is stuck with the storyteller, and it's a vivid memory that they'll never forget. Can I make myself more prone to paranormal experiences? Let me tell you a story about a series of strange events that have happened to one person over the course of their life. It all started with a woman who appeared in the park near their house for two summers in a row. She was always wearing a hijab, completely black, and would stand still on the path for hours on end. It was an eerie sight, and the person couldn't help but feel like there was something not quite right about her presence. But that was just the beginning. One morning, they woke up to find that the landing light, which they'd always left on at night, was already on. It was as if someone had turned it on while they were sleeping. The strange thing was, everything else was still dark, and it took a moment for their eyes to adjust to the sudden change in light. It was almost as if they had woken up in a different reality, one where the light was already on. The next experience was even more paranormal. They were house and dog sitting for their nan and granddad, and one day they heard football chants coming from the bedroom. They went to investigate and found that an old 70s era TV had turned on by itself. It was a spooky experience, but the person felt a strange sense of comfort in knowing that spirits might be real. This feeling was especially poignant because of the person's own history with loss and grief. Their father had passed away when they were just four years old, and they'd carried the pain and trauma with them their whole life. They longed to know if they could somehow connect with him, if there was a way to make themselves open to the possibility of his presence. These strange occurrences may seem unrelated, but to the person experiencing them, they all seem to be connected in some way. It's as if the universe is trying to send them a message, or maybe just trying to get their attention. Whatever the reason, they're left with a sense of wonder and curiosity about the unknown and a deep longing to connect with the spirits that might be out there. I really need help. The following is a story that I've been grappling with for the past decade, and it continues to impact me on a daily basis. I was 18 years old when I stumbled upon a Ouija board in my basement. At the time, I was unaware of the potential dangers of using such a board or the existence of demons and spirits. Out of sheer boredom, I decided to give the board a try. To my disappointment, nothing happened. However, what I didn't know at the time was that I failed to properly close the session by moving the indicator to goodbye. That night I went to sleep and woke up the next morning. I was experiencing extreme psychosis. I immediately went to the hospital and the doctors couldn't explain what was happening to me. From that day forward, I've been plagued with severe psychotic episodes and other sinful tendencies. Deep down, I knew that it was the Ouija board that caused this, even though I had no prior knowledge of the risks associated with using it. Despite my certainty, no one believed me, and I felt alone in my struggles. It wasn't until later that I learned about the workings of demons and how they could infiltrate our lives through objects like the Ouija board. As the years went on, my condition only worsened, and I felt like I was losing control of myself. It has been a decade since that fateful night, and I'm now 28 years old. The impact of that experience continues to weigh heavily on me, and I'm losing hope in myself and who I want to be. I'm reaching out for advice, because I don't know what else to do. I'm in desperate need of help and any guidance would be greatly appreciated. This is a battle that I can't fight alone and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to overcome it. Wondering about my paranormal experiences. I'll start by saying having these experiences, I've always been a skeptic. My mother, who's passed nine years ago, was toward the end of her life a deep believer, as well as both of my sisters. Though after my mother's passing, they haven't spoken much on the subject unless asked about it. But they can verify three of the four stories I'm about to lay out there as well. The first three of these stories take place in my childhood home in a trailer park. 
and it always seemed to have an odd vibe around it in general. Never found anything weird about it, but we always had this theory like Indian burial grounds or something. Though I doubt it. Just a weird little rural area of southwest Michigan. The fourth story takes place in my father and stepmother's house, about eight miles north of the first three stories where they take place. I'll start with what feels like the least intense, moving to the ones that still spark great fear in me. Story 1. I'll start with the story at my father and stepmother's house, as it's pretty simple. I lived there in my early 20s and had the classic downstairs basement room. I was the black sheep of the sort, so it was only fitting to put me there. We had a dog that always stayed with me, especially when the family was out and doing whatever. This happened multiple times, but I'll share the last time I remember it happening. I'm sitting downstairs hanging out, YouTube or whatever I was doing, when my dog, like he normally does when people come home, starts going nuts, barking and pacing for me to let him upstairs so he can greet whoever he believes to come through the door. As I get out of my chair to let him do so, I hear the classic footsteps of what I believe to be my little brother. As they're too fast to be my father or stepmom, I hear them go all the way to the back of the house and then stay there. So I let the dog out, I follow suit, thinking maybe my folks need help grabbing something, maybe they brought home, get upstairs and nothing at all lights off, no one home. Dog is even thinking, what the hell? Now at this point, this is the fourth or fifth time this has happened, in the few years we've been living there, mostly starting in the later part of those years. So this time I felt ballsy about it. I decided like an idiot to just ask if anyone was there, and no answer. So I go further into the house facing the hallway, leading to the back of the house to a couple of bedrooms. I put myself in the bathroom so that when I yell at it, it won't see down the hallway when it comes to get my sorry ass. But I get in the bathroom and like an idiot, I somewhat angrily yelled, who the fuck is in my house? As I point, I hear something fall in the back bedroom between the two bedrooms. I poke my head out to verify and no one's there. Check the garage to see and no one's there and then went back downstairs when I waited for people to actually come. It's not the wildest story ever, but eerie to me. Story number two. This is where, to me, these stories amp up and get really freaky. Just something about this trailer park and the trailer I lived in. This was after living in the trailer with my mom, who my dad then took over after their divorce and was now living there with my stepmom. So, I remember it being maybe 2006. I was 13 or so, and at the time, loved being up as late as it was summer vacation from school. And this summer, I liked smoking pot with my sister late at night in the backyard with my neighborhood boy. This night, not pot. Just us three hanging out smoking cigarettes and talking. For some reason or another, my sister takes her phone out, and I shit you not, for some reason starts recording an audio file. This was on a shit Nokia phone at the time, and the quality's already shit on these things, but recording nonetheless. Not for anything paranormal, but thinking about it now, I don't remember for the life of me what she was trying to record. Point is, she's recording, and we're all three standing there. When all of a sudden, about two or four feet to my right, we all hear the most unsettling, blood-curdling, just nasty woman scream for a solid two seconds. Immediately being like, what in the fuck was that? Even getting so worked up that we called the police who didn't find anything after all, showing 20 minutes later. Best part? My sister, the next day, realized she had been recording this audio file. So she goes into her phone to review it, realizing that she had never thought to stop the recording. But there it was on her phone. So we listen back to it and everything's normal. You can hear us talking right up until this scream, which when this happens in the recording, you hear us go quiet then a static type silence and then you hear us all go what in the fuck was that and then the recording cuts off for a few seconds I always said it was a fox but how loud it was and how close it was the sound should have been on this recording and it most definitely was not thoughts now I have a hard time with these last two stories as they're the only visual experiences I've had and to me are the absolute hardest to explain kind of leaves me feeling out of my wits even thinking about them, let alone about to type it all out. Story number three. So to start, my mom was always a night owl, 
no exception, even when we lived with her until 2005. I think this is somewhere around 2002 or 3. The bedroom I was in was right next to where the kitchen was, and you, in fact, could see right out into the kitchen, but couldn't see the table where we sat from. Here, the angle was cut off at that view. But it wouldn't have been off to the right of the bedroom door looking out. I, make, I remember waking up at about 3 or 4 a.m. or so, and looking out and seeing the dining room light on, and hearing my mom using her sewing machine at the table. So I yelled for her to come in there. I hear the machine stop, and she comes to the doorway. I just remember the most menacing, horrifying, mean look on her face. She just stood there, staring right at me, no words, no nothing. Just this look like, why the fuck are you talking to me right now? I don't really remember at this point if I said or did anything. While she stood there doing this, but just as quick as she was standing there, she just as quickly, still with no words at all, just turned first her head away, and then her body followed suit, and then she just walked away. This, as most would assume, is very much unlike anyone's mom. I very much remember as soon as she was out of sight, I started screaming and crying, and yet again I hear her getting up from her sewing machine, and this time a little more frantic. She comes in asking what's wrong with the classic mom calming down horrified kid going on. So I told her what I'd literally just saw, and she said very plainly that she had not just been in here and that she'd been sewing the whole time. And it's not like my mom to just come in and stare me down menacingly like that, especially at three in the morning to scare me. Thoughts? Story four, my least favorite of these. I don't even like thinking about this one but it's the one I wanted to bring here most, as I just want to know what others may think this thing is. So again, much like the last story, it's three or four in the morning. I'm in the same exact bedroom, bottom bunk. Sister's on the top bunk. And this time, everyone is asleep. All lights in the house are off, and it's pretty quiet. I hear what I believe is a slightly heavy load in our dryer, or maybe the washer machine, a little off balance. The sound wakes me all the way up because it just seems weird. So I roll over to get more comfy and I open my eyes a little bit. As I'm looking around, I see what's some kind of movement and it's in the kitchen. Now again, you can see this from this room out into the kitchen, but not the dining area. And what you saw from my perspective is the island in the kitchen where the sink was. And you could see a little bit to the far side of our living room behind that. So I'm kind of scanning the kitchen, listening to this weird sound I keep hearing, and that's when I see it. I can't say it was standing, as I saw no legs, but standing or stood behind the island, but extremely tall. This very pale, almost 2D-looking man, all white, no features whatsoever, no face, no nothing. As he looked down at his body, it appeared to me more faint, but still a definite white figure or person just stood there. At first I'm thinking it's headlight, maybe just hitting the window from a car outside, but then I realize that this thing has a cowboy type hat on, and not only that, it seems like it's taking its hat off and like tipping its hat in my direction, like it's tipping its hat at me almost. Now at this point I'm generally trying to make sure I'm 100% awake, and I am. So I go back to looking because naturally I just can't look away now. And it just repeats the same exact movements over and over. Pulls the hat down, puts it back on, pulls it down, then back on. All the while this weird sound still happening. So I'm trying to justify it in my mind by thinking somehow the neighbor kid is playing a prank on me. And somehow outside the window, that's a bit behind this thing using some sort of puppet or something. When I realized how stupid a thought this is, that's when I started screaming. My sister wakes up and asks what the hell's going on, and I tell her exactly what I see, and I ask her if she sees it too. Oddly, no, she doesn't at all. This makes me scream more, this time waking up my mom, who, as she comes into the kitchen, turns on the light. It disappeared in that moment. Though I still hear the strange sound, so I ask my mom what the sound is, and if the washer was going, she goes and looks, neither machine is running, and for whatever reason this woman takes one look at me, 
feels my head to see if I have a fever, which I didn't, and then tells me I have a fever, and that that's why I'm seeing stuff like that. So I try and calm, and she leaves the room, turns the kitchen light back off, and sure enough, there this guy is again, still tipping that hat over and over. I manage to roll over and fall asleep somehow after. I still mention the story to my sister, and she still very vividly remembers every bit of it. I always said it was a hat man, but the thing is, what I've read and heard on the hat man is not anything like this. My mother later also recounted the story, and later told me that though she didn't see or hear what I did, she only told me I had a fever to calm me down, and she knew that it wasn't a fever causing it. Thoughts? 